Welcome to Tap Book. Let's continue with part two of the book, The Case of the Curious Curate. Chapter 7 Agatha had decided that Mrs. Essex would have probably returned to the north before she arrived at the cottage, but Mrs. Essex herself answered the door. Oh, it's you, she said. Come in. Maybe you can tell me what I should do with this lot. They're down in the cellar, she said, leading the way to a door under the stairs. As Agatha bent her head to follow her through the low door and down shallow stone steps, she wondered if Mrs. Essex had found something gruesome. There they are, said Mrs. Essex. The small cellar was full of metal wine racks, stacked with dusty bottles. I wouldn't have thought your sister would be a wine collector, said Agatha. If you mean fine wine, forget it. This lot is all homemade. See? She took a bottle out of the nearest rack. A faded white label with the inscription Jellop's Brew had been stuck on the greenish glass. Is it any good? asked Agatha. I never touch alcohol, so I wouldn't know. Agatha thought of the duck races. Nothing like a bit of alcohol to get the punters going, and homemade wine would not be considered sinful. If it tastes all right, I could maybe take the lot off you for a church fete. What? All of it? Yes. How much would you want? If it's for the church, you can have it. I could turn this cellar into a big kitchen. The one upstairs is like a cupboard. But you'd better try some first. We'll take this bottle upstairs and I'll find you a glass. Agatha reflected it was a bit early in the day for alcohol. On the other hand, it was probably pretty mild. She led the way upstairs and Mrs. Essex followed her carrying the bottle. The living room smelt damp and musty. Ruby was too mean to get central heating in, said Mrs. Essex, as if reading her thoughts. Have a seat and I'll get a glass. At least she's being friendly, thought Agatha. I might just find out something. Mrs. Essex returned with a corkscrew and a glass. She drew the cork and poured Agatha a glass of golden liquid. Agatha sniffed it cautiously, then she took a sip. It was sweet, and she normally didn't like sweet wine, but it slid pleasantly down her throat and sent a warm glow coursing through her veins. "'So have you found out anything relevant to my sister's murder?' asked Mrs. Essex. "'No, nothing. All I can think of is that Tristan told her something about somebody, and that somebody found out she knew and decided to silence her. Would she keep such information to herself without telling the police?' Agatha took another large gulp of the wine. "'If she did know something, she might not realise how important it was. She liked secrets, and she liked power. Ruby wasn't a nice person.' I know she's dead, but the fact is that she tormented the life out of me when we were growing up. I remember once. Her voice went on, describing the iniquities of Ruby, while Agatha refilled her glass, enjoying the effect of the wine. It was as if all the golden warmth of summer was surging through her body. She realised Mrs. Essex was asking her a question. I beg your pardon, said Agatha dreamily. I was asking how you pass your time in this village. It seems so cut off. Oh, there's the Ladies' Society. We're always arranging events to raise money for charity. Forgive me, but you don't look the type to enjoy that sort of thing. Are you married? I was. Where is he now? I don't know, said Agatha. A dark tide of misery flooded her. She told Mrs. Essex all about James, all about how he had pretended to be taking holy orders, while fat tears coursed down her cheeks. She went on to tell the bemused lady about her past, about her struggles, about her life, until she realised that somewhere in this sad tale, Mrs. Essex had gone into the kitchen, taking the remains of the bottle of wine, and had replaced it with a steaming mug of coffee. Drink that, said Mrs. Essex. You must forgive me for saying so, but you are drunk. Shock sobered Agatha somewhat. I'm sorry, she said. I don't know what came over me. Alcohol's what came over you. Looks as if that stuff's pretty lethal. Do you still want it? Oh, yes, I'll get John at the pub to collect it, and we can stack it somewhere in the church hall. I'll ask Mrs. Bloxby where it should be stored. Agatha rose unsteadily to her feet. I'll just be on my way. Mrs. Essex scribbled something on a piece of paper and held it out. That's my phone number. Give me a ring when they're coming to collect the wine. Agatha looked at her helplessly. Sorry. It's all right. I think you should go home and sleep it off. 
Agatha was sure the fresh air would restore her, but she had to walk home very slowly and carefully, as her legs were showing an alarming tendency to give way. With a sigh of relief, she opened her front door and went into the sitting room. She would just lie down on the sofa until her head cleared. When she awoke, the room was in darkness. Her cats were sitting on her stomach, looking down at her, their eyes gleaming. Agatha straightened up, and they jumped down on the floor and headed for the kitchen, mewing crossly. What time is it? wondered Agatha. She stumbled to the door and switched on the light, and stared in amazement at her watch. Eight o'clock in the evening. She hurried into the kitchen and opened cans of cat food. Once the cats were fed, she made herself a cup of coffee, and sat down at the kitchen table and lit a cigarette. With the first puff, memory came flooding back. With dreadful clarity, she remembered telling Mrs. Essex everything about her life. Her face flooded with colour and she let out a groan. She wondered what proof that wine was. It had seemed such a good idea for the duck races. She picked up the phone in the kitchen and dialed the vicarage number. When Mrs. Bloxby answered, Agatha told her all about the wine. It's heady stuff. Do you know I gave Mrs. Essex my life story after only a couple of glasses? Do you think it would be safe to serve it? It's in a good cause, said the vicar's wife, and she is giving it away. We'll sell it by the small glass and warn everyone it's very strong. I feel such a fool, wailed Agatha. There was a long silence. Are you still there? asked Agatha anxiously. Yes. I'm thinking. Something just struck me. If it loosened your tongue so effectively, it might have done the same to Tristan de Lons. So it might, said Agatha slowly. I've never behaved like that before. He might have been blackmailing someone we don't know about. John was going to see Peggy Slither again, but he's gone off to London. I might try her myself. I'm going to phone John Fletcher and ask him if he can pick up the wine tomorrow. Where do you want it stored? In the church hall. I'll leave it open tomorrow morning. We could really do with a proper church hall. That one is too small for events, and we always have to use the school hall. Maybe the duck racers could be used to raise money for a new one. Tempting, but save the children comes first. OK. Can you think of any excuse I could use to talk to Peggy Slither again? Mrs. Boxby sat in thought. Then she said, we could involve the Ankham lot in the duck races. Old Mrs. Green is the chairwoman of the Ankham Ladies' Society, but she's poorly at the moment. Peggy is the secretary. You could call on her as my emissary and propose to her that we join forces. Excellent. I'll do that. I'll phone John Fletcher at the pub and ask him if he'll send the truck round to pick up the wine, said Mrs. Bloxby. If the wine is as powerful as you say, perhaps we should mix it with fruit juice and serve a punch. Might be safer, conceded Agatha. Tell John to call Mrs. Essex and tell her what time the truck will be there. I'll try Peggy Slither tomorrow. I'm still feeling shaky. After Mrs. Bloxby had left, Agatha put a frozen shepherd's pie in the microwave. It never struck her as odd that she should be prepared to spend time cooking for her cats and yet be content with microwave meals for herself. Agatha had tried to get interested in cooking. The Sunday supplements for the newspapers were full of recipes and coloured photos of delicious meals. Everyone who was anyone knew how to cook exotic dishes these days. But it was very hard to plan exotic meals for one. She poked at the microwave mess on her plate, forcing herself to eat some of it so that she would not wake up hungry during the night. It's just as well I'm not in love with John, she thought, as she finally settled down for the night. I wish him well with that tart Charlotte Bellinge. But as if to give the lie to this thought, her cat sidled into the bedroom and leaped onto the bed, something they only did when they sensed she was upset. Agatha drove reluctantly to Ancombe the next morning to face Peggy Slither. She now wished she'd waited for John's return and sent him instead. After all, he was the one who'd promised to go. She found herself hoping that Peggy was not at home. But as she parked, got out, and approached the garden gate of the bungalow, she saw Peggy stooped over a flower bed. Hi, said Agatha. Peggy straightened up from her task of planting winter pansies and surveyed Agatha with disfavour. 
Why do British people keep saying hi as if they were Americans? I blame television. Oh, really? Well, a good day to you, and how do you do? said Agatha acidly, forgetting that she'd meant to be nice to Peggy and so encourage her to talk. So what do you want? demanded Peggy. Agatha outlined the idea for the duck races, and Peggy visibly thawed. I'll make the decision to join forces with Carsley, she said. Mrs. Green should never have been made chairwoman. Come inside and let's discuss dates and arrangements. Back into that horrible living room. Agatha said that the 23rd of October, or Saturday, would be a good day. What if it rains? asked Peggy. I'll get a marquee set up in the field for refreshments. If it rains, the races will just need to take place all the same. Will Farmer Brent agree to let us hold it on his land? I'll go and see him, said Agatha. I only know him slightly. I was introduced to him in the pub. He seems a friendly sort. Mrs. Essex, Miss Jellop's sister, is contributing homemade wine. Is she living in her sister's house already? She's just clearing up. I think she and her husband plan to use it for weekends. Must say it's pretty insensitive of her, her sister being recently murdered and all. I think the Jellop woman was slightly off her head. Did you know her? Not very well. Sort of in the way I know the rest of you women from Carsley. Tristan knew her well. Did he talk about her? Had a giggle with me about several of the old biddies in the parish. I can't remember him saying anything about her in particular. You detecting again? Agatha was suddenly sure that she was lying. She was sure that Tristan had said something about Miss Jellop. I'm curious, she said. There's a murderer on the loose. You've done this sort of thing before, if I remember. Yes. Is this how you go about it? Ask questions? Any questions? Something like that, said Agatha. People sometimes remember things they haven't told the police. I could do that. Why should you? demanded Agatha crossly. Because I'd probably be better at it than you. Peggy's eyes gleamed with a competitive light. God, I really do hate this woman, thought Agatha. I have a lot of experience in these cases, said Agatha stiffly. Yes, but I knew Tristan very well. Not well enough to find out anything that might relate to his murder, said Agatha, hoping to goad her into some revelation. That's what you think. If you can find out things, so can I. I remember you even got your picture in the newspapers a couple of times. I didn't do it for fame or glory. As a matter of fact, the priest took the credit in nearly every case. So you say, jeered Peggy. Agatha had had enough. She stood up. The priests don't like amateurs interfering in their investigation. Oh, really? So what about you? You have no professional status. I am discreet. Agatha Raisin, discreet? Peggy gave a great hoarse laugh, and that braying laugh followed Agatha as she marched out of the door. She gave a fishing gnome a savage kick as she passed, and it tumbled into a small pool. I'll show her, muttered Agatha as she got into her car. But how? I'm at a dead end. Once home again, she sat down at her computer and began to type out everything she had learned. As she typed, the engagement ring on her finger winked and flashed. She took it off and put it in the desk drawer. The doorbell rang. She saved what she had typed and went to answer it. Bill Wong said, I think it's time we had a chat, Agatha. Come in, said Agatha reluctantly. I'll make coffee. Instant will do. Agatha switched on the kettle. Her cats jumped up on Bill, purring loudly. He patted them and then removed Hodge from his shoulder and Boswell from his knee and placed them gently on the floor. Agatha made two cups of coffee and placed them on the table along with milk and sugar. I think I've some cake left, she said. Never mind the cake. Sit down, I want to talk to you. I see you're not wearing your ring. I was typing on the computer and it kept flashing in the light and distracting me. What do you want to talk to me about? I've never known you before to let things lie in a murder case, said Bill. I feel damn sure you've been ferreting around. Is there anything you haven't been telling me? You know about Bin, sir? Yes, I've been asking a few questions, but not getting anywhere. Someone Tristan knew, like Miss Jellop, learned something about the murderer. I should think that was pretty obvious. Unless it wasn't related. Unless maybe her sister bumped her off. 
Mrs. Essex has a cast iron alibi. Now out with it, who have you been talking to? You may as well know. I went to see a Mrs. Peggy Slither this morning. Why her? That repulsive woman was friendly with Tristan, but she won't tell me anything. The silly cow has decided to turn detective herself. I'd better see her. If she's holding anything back, she might tell me. Where does she live? Agatha gave him directions. Then she said, There was Mrs. Tremp. We spoke to her. The fact that she was about to give Tristan money and was saved by his murder is all we know. Think, Agatha. Has anyone else in this village got enough money to have attracted Tristan's attentions? There are a good few around. I can't bring anyone to mind. I mean, sometimes in the Cotswolds, people with a good amount put by for their retirement live in quite modest homes. People are living so long these days, and they all dread the inevitable high fees of a nursing home. I'll ask Mrs. Bloxby, said Bill. She might be able to think of someone. Where's John Armitage? He's up in London. Agatha coloured faintly. Had she told Bill about Charlotte Bellinge? Better keep some bits of the investigation to herself. Pride would not let her confess to Bill that John had gone up to London to see an attractive woman. There's a favour I want to ask you, said Bill. You know I told you about my girlfriend Alice. Oh, yes, that's still on? Very much so, said Bill, beaming. Been to meet your parents yet? No. Obviously not, thought Agatha, or it wouldn't still be on. You see, continued Bill, I feel I've made mistakes in the past by introducing my girlfriends to my parents too early on. Makes them think I'm getting too heavy. But I would like Alice to meet my friends. I've got the evening off. May I bring her over? I'd be honoured, said Agatha. Bring her for dinner. Maybe not. She's a vegan. Oh dear. But I think I can cope. No need to do that. What if I bring her for drinks, say, for an hour, about seven o'clock, and then I can take her for dinner somewhere? Right you are. When Bill had left, Agatha returned to her computer and ran over what she'd already written. If Miss Jellop had learned something from Tristan, something dangerous, then it must be about someone in Carsley or one of the other nearby villages. And what of Mrs. Tremp? Perhaps it would be a good idea to try that lady again. She decided to walk. Too much driving everywhere meant she wasn't getting enough exercise. But as she trudged up out of the village, she was assailed again by the old longing to just let herself go, stop chasing after men, give up the battle against age. John Armitage, whom she had almost come to think of as asexual, had fled off to London, apparently smitten by Charlotte Bellinge. There was a faint hope that he might be trying to find out something relevant to the case, but Agatha doubted it. And how could a stocky, middle-aged woman compete with a porcelain blonde? Not that I want to, thought Agatha. I mean, I'm not at all interested in John. I wonder if I should go blonde. Do blondes really have more fun? Why not try? She tugged her mobile phone out of her handbag and called her hairdresser. Yes, they had a cancellation and could fit her in at three that afternoon. Mrs. Tremp was at home and not at all pleased to see Agatha. If you've called to ask me about the murders, I don't know anything, she said. I actually called to see if you could help with the duck races, lied Agatha. Mrs. Tremp looked diverted. Duck races? What on earth are they? Agatha explained. That does sound a good idea, and I do like to help in charity work. Come in. What is it you'd like me to do? Last time I was here you said you were making jam, said Agatha. I wondered if you would consider setting up a table at the races and selling some of your homemade jam. You need not contribute what you make for any sales to the charity if you do not want to. It's just that stands with homemade jams and cakes lend a country air to the proceedings. Oh, no, I'd be glad to contribute. Who is making the cakes? I thought I might ask the members of the Ladies' Society. No need for that. Do sit down, Mrs. Raisin. I will bake cakes as well. To be honest, time does lie heavy on my hands. The Colonel, when he was alive, kept me so busy. As a matter of fact, I've just made some carrot cake. Would you like some? That would be very nice. Tea? Yes, please. When Mrs. Tremp retreated to the kitchen, Agatha wondered how to broach the subject of Tristan. 
Perhaps just talk about the races and village matters and see if Mrs. Tremp herself volunteered anything. The carrot cake proved to be delicious. Agatha ate two large slices, comforting herself with the thought that the walk home might counteract the calories. She talked further about the plans for the races, and then volunteered the information that Mrs. Essex was contributing a cellar full of homemade wine. Who is this Mrs. Essex? asked Mrs. Tremp. Miss Jellop's sister. How odd! She's staying at her sister's home. Only, I think, to clear up. I believe she and her husband plan to use it for weekends and holidays. Sad, that. I mean the life is draining out of the villages. I mean the community life. Soon the whole of the Cotswolds will be some sort of theme park full of tourists, incomers and weekenders. There are few like you, Mrs. Raisin, who are prepared to do their bit. I'm sorry I was so cross with you, but the murder of poor Tristan upset me. He had a way of making me feel good about myself. I suppose the secret is to feel good about oneself without relying on other people, but that is a very hard thing to do. Of course, I've wondered and wondered what could have brought about his death. He was extremely attractive. Perhaps it was a crime of passion. Could be. Somehow I think it was to do with money. And somehow I get a feeling that after I left him on his last night, something happened to make him want to run for it. Has anyone said anything about anyone strange being seen in the village? I only usually speak to people in church or people in the general stores. They're all mystified. If you can think of anything, let me know. Agatha tactfully turned the conversation back to village matters and then took her leave. When she returned home, she checked her supply of drinks to see if she had a good enough selection, ate a hurried lunch of microwave lasagna, and got into her car and drove to the hairdressers in Evesham, all the while telling herself that she did not really need to go blonde. She could always change her mind at the last minute. Early that evening, she rushed up to the fright magnifying mirror in the bathroom for yet another look. Her thick hair was a warm honey blonde, and yet, and yet she did not feel like Agatha Raisin. Agatha went into the bedroom for a look in the wardrobe mirror, a stranger looked back at her. She was wearing a plain black Georgette dress, cleverly cut to make her look slimmer than she was. Perhaps some eyeshadow? She went back to the bathroom. She carefully applied beige eyeshadow, then liner and mascara, and had just finished when the doorbell rang. "'You've gone blonde,' said Bill, goggling at her. "'This is Alice.' "'Come along in,' said Agatha. As she led the way to the sitting room, she heard Alice mutter, "'You said she was old,' and then Bill's quiet rejoinder, "'I said older than me.' Agatha crossed to the drinks trolley. "'What will you have, Alice? Woman Coke?' "'Oh, dear,' said Agatha. "'I don't know if I've got any Coke.' "'Sherry will do if you've got that,' said Alice. "'I'll have a soft drink,' said Bill. "'Tonic water. That will be fine.' Agatha busied herself with the drinks, handed them round, and sat down opposite Alice and Bill, who were seated side by side on the sofa. It was the first occasion since their arrival that Agatha was able to get a good look at Alice. She had curly brown hair, wide eyes, and a pugnacious jaw. She had a generous bosom, a thick waist, and chubby legs. "'Have you known Bill long?' asked Alice. She took Bill's hand in hers and held it firmly. "'Ever since I came down here, Bill was my first friend. Seems odd.' Alice took a sip of her drink and wrinkled her nose. "'I like sweet sherry,' she said. "'I don't have any of that. May I offer you something else? Don't bother. Just put this in a bigger glass and add some tonic water.' Oh dear, thought Agatha, but doing as requested. What's odd, she asked. Well, I mean, Bill being young and you old. We were not having an affair, said Agatha acidly. Found out anything more about the case, asked Bill hurriedly. Why, oh why, he wondered, did Agatha Raisin have to go blonde and put on a slinky dress? Agatha shook her head. She told him about the duck races. Alice laughed, a harsh and brittle sound. Kid stuff. I will not be nasty to this girl for Bill's sake, no matter what she says, vowed Agatha. Oh, it will be amusing, I assure you, she said lightly. 
How do you enjoy working in the bank, Alice? It's all right. Interesting customers, some of them. Some of them think the bank's a bottomless pit of money. They come in saying the machine outside won't give them anything. I just tell them, you're wasting my time and your own. If that machine says you can't have any money, then you can't. She laughed. You should see their faces. How can Bill like such a creature? marvelled Agatha. But Bill was smiling at Alice fondly. Alice stood up. Can I use the little girl's room? It's at the top of the stairs. When Alice had left, Bill grinned. I'm rather enjoying this. Why? demanded Agatha. I've never seen Alice jealous before. You would choose this night to turn yourself into a blonde bombshell. I should find it flattering, but I'm finding this visit awkward, Bill. Are you really keen on her? I think this is the one, Agatha. You're seeing her at her worst. You should be flattered. Agatha opened her mouth to say she wasn't feeling flattered at all when Alice returned. Deciding to keep the conversation away from Alice, Agatha discussed the case with Bill, while all the time she thought he really mustn't get tied up with such a creature. But she promised herself she would not interfere in his life. But as they were leaving, Agatha said politely, Give my regards to your parents, Bill. Alice, who had reached the front door ahead of Bill, swung round. I haven't met your parents. I would like to meet your parents. And so you shall, said Bill. Thanks for the drinks, Agatha. I'll call you soon. Agatha slammed the door behind them. Bill's formidable mother would soon send Alice packing, but what a horror she was. Agatha surveyed herself in the hall mirror. She sighed. It just wouldn't do. Then she was struck by the thought that John, seeing her as a blonde, might get the idea that she was trying to compete with Charlotte and she would look pathetic. Agatha resolved to get it all dyed back the way it was as soon as possible. She had arranged so that the phone would not ring during Bill's visit. She picked up the receiver to put it back on the ringing tone and found she had a message. She dialed 1571 and waited. You have one message said the carefully elocuted voice of British Telecom. To listen to your messages, please press 1. Agatha did that, and Peggy Slither's voice sounded. I'm streets ahead of you. You'll never guess what I found out. I'm just going to check a few more facts, and then I'm going to the police. Agatha saved the message. I don't think she knows anything at all, she thought. She bit her lip. She picked up the receiver again and arranged the ringing tone and replaced it again. She was just turning away when it rang. It was Mrs. Bloxby. How are things with you, Mrs. Raisin? I'm not getting any further. Oh, Bill was just round with his latest love and she's horrible. Nasty, bullying sort of girl. Well, as you've pointed out before, they never last after a visit to his parents. He hasn't taken her to see them yet, but he's going to, so that should be the end of that. I gather from what you've told me that he usually favours nice, quiet girls. Maybe this one will be a match for his mother. No one, said Agatha with feeling, is a match for Bill's mother. Oh, there's something else. She told the vicar's wife about her visit to Peggy and the message she'd just received. There was a silence, and then Mrs. Bloxby said, I don't like this. I can't help remembering the time when Miss Jellop phoned me up. Do you think she could be in danger? I don't know. She did know Tristan pretty well. I tell you what, I'll phone her and see what she's up to. Probably just bragging. I'll let you know. Agatha rang off and looked up Peggy's number in the phone book and dialed. She got the engaged signal. She went into the kitchen and looked in the freezer for something to microwave. The cats wove their way around her ankles. You've been fed twice, complained Agatha. She picked out a packet of frozen steak and kidney pudding and put it in the microwave to defrost. She tried Peggy's number again, but it was still engaged. She returned to the kitchen and heated the steak and kidney pudding and shoveled the mess onto a plate. The cats sniffed the air and then slunk off uninterested. Agatha picked at her food with a fork. After she'd managed to eat most of it, she dialed Peggy's number, still engaged. I'll drive along and see her, thought Agatha. She went upstairs and changed into a sweater, slacks, and flat shoes. She tied a scarf over her hair, because the more she looked at it, the more it began to seem too vulgar bright. The night was blustery with wind, 
The lilac tree at the gate dipped and swayed, sending leaves scurrying off down the lane. A tiny moon sailed in and out of the clouds above. Agatha looked ruefully at John's dark cottage. She felt that she would have liked him to go along with her. The road to Ancombe was quiet. She passed only two cars on the way, and one late-night rambler trudging along, scarf over the lower part of the face as protection against the wind. When Agatha parked outside Peggy's cottage and saw that all the lights were on and music was blaring out, she experienced a feeling of relief. Peggy was obviously entertaining. Still, thought Agatha, having come this far, I may as well see if she'll give me a hint of what she's found out. If I handle it properly, she may be tempted to brag. She walked up the garden path where plaster gnomes leered at her from the shrubbery. The village people were belting out YMCA. The door was standing slightly ajar. Agatha walked into the little hall. The music crashed about her ears, but she could not hear any voices. Suddenly frightened, she pushed open the door of the living room and reeled before the increased blast of noise. She walked over to the stereo and switched it off. Now the silence, broken only by the sound of the peeing statue and the wind outside, was more frightening than the noise of the music. Peggy? croaked Agatha. She cleared her throat and shouted loudly, Peggy! Agatha looked longingly at the phone, which was in the shape of a shoe. Call the police before you look any further, she told herself. But something impelled her to go out and across the hall and push open the kitchen door at the back. She fumbled inside the door for a light switch, and finding it, pressed it down. Fluorescent light blazed down on the kitchen, on the blood on the white walls, on the blood on the floor, and on the savagely cut body of Peggy Slither, lying by the back door. Agatha let out a whimper and stood with her hand to her mouth. She forced herself to kneel down by that terrible body and feel for a pulse. No life. No life at all. She rose and scrambled back to the living room and seized the phone and dialed the police. Then she went outside and leaned her head against the cold wall of the cottage. This book is continued on Disc 4. Disc 4 Chapter 8 For the next two weeks, Carsley was a village under siege. It was flooded by press and by sightseers. Finally, rough weather drove the sightseers away, leaving behind them soda cans and sandwich wrappers, and another Balkan uprising sent the press rushing back to London. It was a relief to walk down the village streets without being accosted by reporters. The members of the Ladies' Society picked up all the rubbish left behind and bagged it. Even John Fletcher, landlord of the Red Lion, who had done a roaring trade, was glad to see the last of the press and the gawking public. John Armitage had returned from London as soon as he had heard the news of the latest murder. Agatha was once more restored to a brunette, having gone straight to the hairdressers the day after the murder and right after signing her statement at police headquarters in Merchester. Only the dogged police were left, still going from house to house in Carsley and in the neighbouring villages, questioning everyone over and over again. The weapon with which Peggy had been so brutally murdered had never been found. Agatha had expected John to be a frequent caller to discuss the case, but he seemed quiet and withdrawn, saying he was behind with his writing and had to catch up. She herself had been frightened into inactivity, although she would not admit it to herself, such as Agatha Raisin hardly ever admitted to being frightened. She persuaded herself that three murders was just too much. Out there was a madman who should be left to the police. But she lost weight through nerves, waking up during the night at the slightest sound and picking at her food during the day. Mrs. Broxby had given up urging Agatha to find the killer. It really is not safe for you, Mrs. Raisin, she said. What if this dreadful murderer should decide you knew something as well? The day after the press had gone, John Armitage called round. Are you eating? he asked anxiously as if noticing Agatha properly for the first time since his return from London. You look haggard! Agatha glared at him. Despite her fright, she had been pleased with her new slim-lined figure. I did find the body, she snapped. 
John sat down at the kitchen table. And what about you? asked Agatha. What have you been doing? I told you, writing and more writing. But you've never said anything about how you got on in London. There's nothing much to tell. I saw my publisher, I saw my agent, I saw my friends. And you had at least one dinner with Charlotte Bellinge. How did you know that? There was a parcel sticking out of your letterbox. I opened your door to put it on the table and heard her dulcet tones on your answering machine. He coloured faintly. I thought there might be a lead there, but there was nothing further to add. I did go back to see that vicar at New Cross, but he said he was busy and slammed the door in my face. Don't you find that suspicious? Not really. I think he's guilty about having lied to us in the first place. Anyway, to get back to Peggy Sliver, she thought she'd found out something. And you saw nothing around her home before you found the body? No sinister men? Nothing. Any cars on the road? Agatha frowned in thought. Two passed me, going away from Ankham, but don't ask me the colour or make. It was dark, and I didn't notice them in particular. Suddenly, in her mind's eye, she was driving towards Ankham that evening. The Rambler, she exclaimed. I forgot about the Rambler. What Rambler? Did you tell the police? No, I forgot about him. The shock of finding Peggy lying in all that blood drove him right out of my head. What was he like? asked John eagerly. I just got a glimpse. One of those dark woolly hats and a scarf over the lower part of his face. An anorak, a backpack, dark trousers. A scarf over his face, and you didn't think that suspicious? There was a freezing wind that night. Oh, God, I'd better tell the police. They'll think me such a fool for forgetting. The doorbell rang. You get it, John, said Agatha, probably some lingering local reporter. To think of the days when I cultivated the press. John went to the door and came back a few moments later, followed by Bill Wong. There you are, Agatha. You want the police, and here's Bill. Why do you want the police? asked Bill, shrugging off his raincoat and placing it on a chair. I've just remembered something. Agatha told him about the rambler. Agatha! Bill sounded exasperated. Why didn't you remember this before? I'm off duty, but get me a piece of paper. I'll need to take this down. Agatha went through to her desk and came back with a sheet of paper, and then sat down and described the rambler. Do you know what I think? Bill put down his pen with a sigh. I think our murderer was very lucky. Wilkes is going to be furious when I tell him this. If you'd told us right away on the night of the murder, we could have put up roadblocks. We could have scoured the countryside for him. I'd best get off. We'll put out a police bulletin asking him to come forward. He got to his feet and put on his coat. Where was Alf Bloxby on the evening of the murder? asked John. According to his wife, he was out on his rounds all evening. We've interviewed all the people he said he'd been to see, but it still leaves an hour unaccounted for. Mrs. Bloxby never told me that. Agatha experienced a pang of unease. What does the vicar say he was doing during that hour? He says he was just walking about. He says the whole business of Tristan's murder had upset him dreadfully, and he felt like taking a good walk before bedtime to clear his head. Sounds reasonable, said Agatha. She followed him to the door. Why did you call? Social visit. How's Alice? She's fine. Take her to see your parents. Yes, they loved her. Oh dear, thought Agatha. She saw him out and returned to the kitchen. Why did you ask about Alf Bloxby? she demanded. I've been thinking. Just because we love Mrs. Bloxby it doesn't mean we know anything about Alf. Do you? No, I don't know much, but I do know this. Such as Mrs. Bloxby would never, ever stay married to any man capable of murder. She might not know he was capable of murder. Rubbish. I mean, did she say anything to you about Alf being unable to account for an hour of his movements? He did account for them. But only his word, no witnesses. Let's go and see her. All right, if it'll make you feel any better. You're not wearing your ring. Oh, that, I'd forgotten about it. Do you want me to put it on? May as well maintain the fiction. We don't need to maintain it in front of Mrs. Bloxby. But we do in front of other people, said John. Agatha went through to her desk and fished out the ring and put it on her finger. It felt loose. Good heavens, she thought, I'm even losing weight on my fingers. 
Leaves wheeled and whirled about them as they walked to the vicarage. To Agatha, the village no longer felt like a safe haven. She felt there was menace lurking around every corner. She longed for a cigarette, and remembered the days when one never, ever smoked in the street. Now the street was about the only place outside one's own home where one could smoke. Mrs. Broxby opened the door to them. Come in quietly, she said. Alf is resting. They followed her into the vicarage sitting room. Agatha and Mrs. Broxby surveyed each other. Mrs. Broxby noticed that Agatha was considerably thinner, and Agatha noticed that Mrs. Broxby's usually mild eyes held a haunted look. They had talked since the murder, but only briefly. Agatha told her about the Rambler, and Mrs. Broxby clasped her hands as if in prayer. If only you had remembered this earlier, Mrs. Raisin. They're putting out a bulletin asking him to come forward, said John. If he's innocent, he will. I've been thinking about ramblers, said Agatha. I mean, one never really notices them. Not groups of ramblers, commented Mrs. Broxby with a certain edge in her voice, but one on his own at night. I know, I know, mourned Agatha, but the horror of Peggy's murder drove it right out of my mind until today. Bill was round this morning, said John. He says there's a whole hour your husband can't account for. Most of us have whole hours in our lives we can't account for, said Mrs. Broxby. It's just unlucky for Alf. His hour should have happened on the evening Peggy was murdered. All this is wearing my husband down. I could do without your suspicions being added to our worries, Mr. Armitage. I didn't. Yes, you did, interrupted Mrs. Broxby. She rounded on Agatha. I thought you'd given up investigating. I had, said Agatha, silently cursing John. Whoever is committing these murders is highly dangerous. I suggest you both leave it to the police. Now, if you don't mind, I have things to do. They both left the vicarage, Agatha furious with John. I never should have gone along with you, she said. Mrs. Broxby is my best friend. Never mind. It's lunchtime and you look a ghost of your former self. We'll go to the pub and have something. Agatha was about to say pettishly that she didn't want to go with him, but realised she was reluctant to be on her own. All right, she said ungraciously, but I don't want much. In the pub they both ordered shepherd's pie. Although there were quite a few regulars at the bar, there wasn't much conversation. The murders had poisoned the atmosphere. Agatha surprised herself by eating all the food on her plate. She decided it was time she went in for some decent home cooking instead of microwave meals. When they'd finished, she looked curiously at John. You're strangely reticent about Charlotte Bellinge. If I had anything relating to the case to tell you, Agatha, I would. I don't think you went to see her because you thought she had anything to add. I think you're smitten with her. She is a very attractive woman, but no, I am not smitten with her. So, she rejected your advances. Don't be cheeky, Agatha. We're only pretending to be engaged. You have no right to question me on my personal life. This was indeed true, but for some reason Agatha did not want to be reminded of it. So, you told me briefly before that you'd been to see Mrs. Essex and Mrs. Tremp. Nothing there, I gathered? No, except the wine. What wine? Agatha told him about the homemade wine and the odd effect it had had on her. That's interesting, said John. You mean Miss Jellop may have given Tristan some, and he might have told her things he wouldn't otherwise have said. Could be. John sighed. Ah, now she's dead, we'll never know. What about Mrs. Tremp? There was something cold-blooded about the way she talked about her husband's death. If a woman can sit looking at her husband who's just had a stroke without immediately calling an ambulance, then she must be really pretty tough. I don't know. I kept the discussion to the duck races. She seemed pretty friendly and normal. Did she know Peggy Sliver? I don't know. Let's go and ask her. I somehow don't want anyone to know we're still investigating, said Agatha. You told me she was going to bake cakes for the big event. We'll ask her how she's getting on. I suppose we could do that. After they had returned to Lilac Lane and had driven off in John's car, Agatha felt the black edges of depression hovering around her. For years she had been driven by her obsession for James Lacey, getting James Lacey and marrying James Lacey. Then she had been divorced by him. 
After that, she lived in dreams that one day he would return to her. Cold reality was telling her he would never return. Parsley had become a sinister place. She was going to interview a woman who probably did not know anything at all relevant to the case with a man she was pretending to be engaged to. Bill Wall, who had been a sort of soulmate in that he was always being rejected by the loves of his life, had at last found one who evidently could stand up to his parents. "'What's up?' asked John. "'Nothing. Why? This car's filling up with gloom and it's coming from you. I've got a bit of a headache, that's all. Want to go back home and take some aspirin?' No, I'll be all right. Here we are. She's probably at home. I don't think she goes out much. They parked and got out of the car. The door was standing open. Agatha rang the bell beside the door. The bell shrilled somewhere inside the house. That's odd, said John. She must be in. Try again. Agatha rang the bell and waited. I think we'd better take a look inside, said John uneasily. Agatha walked in first. "'Mrs. Tramp!' she called. No reply. Outside the rooks cawed from their tree, and the wind rushed around the converted barn. Followed by John, she walked into the kitchen and let out a scream. Mrs. Tramp was lying stretched out on the floor, her eyes closed and her hands folded on her breast. "'See if she's alive,' said John, tugging a mobile phone out of his pocket. "'I'll call the police.' Mrs. Tramp opened her eyes at that moment and struggled to her feet. "'It is my meditation hour,' she said crossly. "'I do not like to be disturbed. I hoped you would go away.' She smoothed down her tweed skirt with her hands. "'What do you want?' Agatha sank down onto a kitchen chair. "'I just wanted to ask if you could cope with all the cake-baking for the ducks' race.' "'Of course,' said Mrs. Tramp. "'I would have told you if I could not. How are the arrangements going?' "'I'm on my way to see Farmer Brent,' said Agatha. "'You mean you haven't got permission from him yet? we will better hurry up. It's only three weeks to the races.' "'Isn't it terrible about Peggy Slither?' said John. "'Oh, her!' Mrs. Tremp gave a disdainful sniff. "'Probably her ex-husband. He was furious at having to pay out so much after the divorce proceedings.' "'Did you know her?' asked Agatha. "'Tristan took me over to meet her once. Disgusting, vulgar woman.' I gather Tristan was friendly with her. She was so rude to me that Tristan assured me he would have nothing more to do with her. And you haven't heard from her since? Why should I? Such as Mrs. Slither and such as myself have absolutely nothing in common. Now, I do have things to do. I suggest you get Mr. Brent's permission as soon as possible. We couldn't really stay to get more out of her, said John, as they drove on to Brent's farm at the top of the hill. She's got a study off the hall, said Agatha. The door was open, and I looked in as we went out. There's a desk there with letters and correspondence. I'd love to have a look at them. I think she's hiding something. I wonder if Tristan ever wrote to her. Why should he? asked John. I mean, he was in the same village. Still, I wouldn't mind having a look. Maybe she wrote to someone about him. Then the someone will have the letter, not Mrs. Trent. There was a computer on the desk. Maybe she's got letters logged in it. The days when it was considered bad manners to type a letter to a friend of long gone. I don't know how you're ever going to have a chance to look at them. Maybe. I wonder if she locks her door at night. Meaning, said John, you plan to creep in one night and have a look. Don't be silly. There'd be all hell to pay if you were caught. Is that the entrance to Brent's farm on the left? Yes, let's hope he's at home. I don't feel like trekking over muddy fields looking for him. To her relief, Mark Brent opened the door to them himself. "'I was just about to have a cup of tea,' he said. He was a tall, thin man, with long arms and stooped shoulders. His thick hair was grey, and his long face burnt red by working outdoors. "'The wife's off visiting her sister,' he said. He prepared a pot of tea and put mugs and milk and sugar on the table. "'It's about these duck races. I remember you had an event for the Boy Scouts in one of your fields with a pretty stream running through it. She told him all about the duck races. That's all yours, said Brent. There's cattle in that field, but I'll move them for the day. When is it to be held? October 23rd. Fine. I like to do my bit. Help yourselves. I'm glad I'm outside the village. It's as if that dumb curate in his poncy ways brought something evil in with him. You knew Tristan? asked Agatha. 
My wife Gladys was friendly with him. I'd come in from the fields, and there they'd be laughing and joking, and Gladys looking like a dog's dinner all tarted up in her Sunday best, although it was a weekday. Then she tells me she wants a check for this Tristan. She says he could invest money for us and make a killing. I said the only killing was going to be Tristan himself. There was something slimy about him. So I got him one day in the village, and told him if he came near my wife again, I'd set the dogs on him. Poor Gladys cried and cried when I told her and called me a monster. I put up with it, I says, until he tried to get money out of you. After she thought he fancied her. Now, don't get me wrong. My Gladys is a fine-looking woman, but she's in her fifties. He looked at Agatha. Didn't have you fooled as well, did he, Mrs. Raisin? I heard how you had dinner with him the night he was murdered. No, said Agatha. He did suggest investing money for me, but I refused. And I hear you pair are engaged. That's right, said Agatha. How did you hear that? All over the village it is. Good on you. I wish you both well. You'll be getting married in the church, nothing like a good old-fashioned village wedding. You didn't threaten to kill Tristan, asked John. I mean, did I stick a knife in him? No, that's not my way. A telling off was enough. I didn't mean... I know what you meant, said the farmer with unimpaired good humour. Our Mrs. Raisin here has made a name for herself as a detective. Seems as if you're well suited. I found Peggy Slither, said Agatha. On the road to Ancombe I noticed this rambler. I've only just remembered and told the police. You didn't at any time see anyone strange about the village. Not on the days of the murders. We're not a tourist place like Broadway. We get these chaps selling kitchen stuff round the doors. Then there are women from the Red Cross, and the lifeboat people come round collecting. Rumblers, of course. A few outsiders at the bed and breakfast places. But I gather the police have checked them all out. I think all of us have had the police round asking questions three or four times. But I'll tell you this, Mrs. Raisin. His voice became hard. Whoever is doing these here murders is a dangerous man. I think you should sit this one out and leave it to the police. Don't want you getting hurt. Sounds like a threat, said John. Just a bit of sensible advice. Now I'd best get out there. There's fencing to be repaired. I think that was a threat, said Agatha as they drove off. I don't know. Seems a straightforward enough man to me. Agatha sighed. Well, I'd better throw myself into the publicity for these duck races. I'll be round at Mrs. Broxby's if you want me. Right. I'll get on with some more writing. Agatha spent the afternoon discussing arrangements such as the hiring of a marquee with Mrs. Bloxby, and phoning up local papers, arranging advertisements for the duck races to go in, and also for free publicity. But once a public relations officer, always a public relations officer. She also sent press handouts to all the nationals and TV stations to the effect that the murder village was returning to normal. Might get a few of them down from London. It was only that evening that her thoughts turned to Mrs. Tremp's desk. No one in the village would leave their doors open at night after three murders, but country people often left a spare key in the gutter, or under the doormat, or in a flower pot. Had Agatha not felt the black edges of depression returning, she would never have decided to try to break into Mrs. Tremp's home. But action, and thoughts of action, kept the depression at bay. She set her alarm for two in the morning, but she was so restless that she only fell asleep at twelve-thirty and woke at the alarm's shrill sound feeling groggy. She dressed in dark clothes and decided to walk. Thank goodness Mrs. Trump doesn't keep a dog, she thought, as she finally reached the converted barn. The guttering was too high up for anyone to reach, and there was no doormat or flower pot. Frustrated and not wanting to turn back, now she'd come so far, she walked round the side of the house. That must be the study window, she thought. Easy to break a pane of glass and release the catch, but that would mean Mrs. Tremp might hear the noise. Shining the light of a pencil torch at the ground to make sure she did not trip over anything, she made her way round to the back of the house. At the back there was a trap door in the ground with coal dust around it. She eased back the bolt and lifted the trap door and looked down. Coal had been delivered recently, and glittered with reptilian blackness in the faint beam of her torch. She eased herself down onto the top of the pile. The coal began to slide under her feet. 
She reached upwards, trying to catch the top of the trap door, but she was descending too fast, crashing down among rumbling lumps of coal to finally land at the bottom of the cellar. She lay there, her heart thumping. She'd lost her torch, but there was faint light from the open trap door. She crawled to her feet, feeling bruised. She could dimly make out a stone staircase. Agatha was just creeping towards it when she heard from above someone running down the stairs and then a key being turned in the cellar door. Then she heard the front door of the house opening and footsteps hurrying round the side of the house. Agatha scrambled away from the coal and into a corner piled with old suitcases and boxes. Mrs. Tremp's voice said triumphantly, Got you! You can wait in there until the police come! She slammed down the trap door, and Agatha could hear her shooting the bolt across. Agatha felt her way across the floor on her hands and knees, with the mad idea of trying to climb up the coal stack and force the trap door. Her hand touched her lost torch, and she grabbed it eagerly. No, she could not force the trap door. She must hide somewhere, somewhere the police would not find her. The beam of the torch let on a rusty suit of armour covered in coal dust. In a mad panic, Agatha hauled the suit upright. It was unusually light, probably a replica. She lifted off the helmet and headpiece. Standing on one of the old suitcases, and putting the legs of the suit at an angle, she eased herself into them. She put on the breastplate, and fastened it with the leather straps at the back. Then she put on the gauntlets, and lifted the headpiece over her head, and with a trembling hand forced the rusty visor down, shuffled off into the corner, and stood there. It was then she realised that because of the murders, it wouldn't be one local policeman from Morton in Marsh who would arrive, but probably the whole squad from Merchester. She stood there trembling with cold and fright, until she heard the wail of police sirens drawing closer and closer. Then Mrs. Tremp's voice, shrill with excitement. I've got him locked in the cellar! He can't get out! The cellar door opened. The light was switched on. There was a light switch at the top of the stairs, thought Agatha. But Mrs. Tremp had sounded the alarm before I could have reached it. Bill Wong was there with Wilkes. Four policemen were systematically going through the cellar, turning over boxes, raking over the coal. Coal dust rose in the air. Agatha prayed she would not sneeze. And then Bill Wong walked over to the suit of armour which encased the trembling Agatha. He raised the visor. A pair of terrified, bear-like eyes stared back at him. Bill slammed down the visor. Nothing here, he said. After the search was over, Agatha could hear Wilkes complaining that everyone around was getting hysterical, and that Mrs. Tremp had probably left the trap door open herself or the coalman had. She'd said a load of coal had been delivered only that day. The coal must have shifted and tumbled down in the night. At last, Agatha was left alone. She lifted off the visor, took off the gauntlets and headpiece, and lay against a pile of boxes and eased out of the armoured legs. The house was silent again. She crept up the cellar stairs and tried the door. It was unlocked. Agatha walked through a laundry room and then into the hall. All she wanted to do now was escape. She tiptoed to the front door and gently unlocked it and slid back the bolt. Mrs. Tremp would just have to think that in all the excitement she'd forgotten to lock the door. She hurried down the hill, keeping to the shadow of the trees. She let out a sob of relief when she turned into Lila Clay. She reached her cottage door and put her key in the lock. A voice in her ear said, What the hell were you playing at? Agatha gave a stifled scream and turned round. Bill Wong's eyes gleamed at her in the darkness. Oh, Bill, babbled Agatha. I'm so sorry, so very sorry. Let's go inside. You've some explaining to do. In the fluorescent light of the kitchen, Agatha was a sorry sight. She was black with coal dust. I'd let you clean yourself up first, said Bill, but I'm in a hurry. Agatha seized a handful of kitchen paper and ran it under the coal tap, and then wiped her face and hands. She sat down at the kitchen table. Bill, thank you for not betraying me. I should have done, he said grimly. This could cost me my job if anything came out. Lucky for you that Mrs. Tremp came to the conclusion that the coalman had left that trap door open, and rats or something had shifted the coal during the night. She was most apologetic. So, what have you been up to? In a halting voice, Agatha told him all about her plan to look at the papers on Mrs. Tremp's desk, and also to see what was in her computer. 
Now listen to me very carefully, said Bill. If I ever catch you doing anything like that again, I will not only have you arrested, our friendship will be at an end. I risk my job for you, Agatha. Have all the stupid things to do. This is one case you're going to leave strictly alone from now on. If you do hear of anything relevant to the case, then you are to tell me immediately. I'm going to get some sleep with what is left of the night. Any news of the Rambler? Lucky for you there is. He walked into police headquarters around seven o'clock this evening. I mean, yesterday evening. Respectable computer nerd, member of a rambling society, said he liked night walking on his own occasionally. No record. Why lucky for me? If no one had turned up, it would have looked as if that faulty memory of yours had lost us the chance of getting the killer. Before I go, why Mrs. Trent? Did she say something you aren't telling me about? John and I saw her earlier in the day. Preston had taken her once to meet Peggy Slither. There's something not quite right about Mrs. Tramp. When her husband had his fatal stroke, she sat watching him for a bit before calling the ambulance. She seemed to be, well, gleeful that he was dead. And that's all you have to go on. I know it sounds silly, but I've had good answers before. Agatha, for the last time, leave it alone. Okay, said Agatha wearily. She saw him to the door. Give my regards to Alice. His tired face lit up. Thanks, I will. Agatha shut and locked the door behind him and set the burglar alarm. Then she crawled wearily up the stairs and stripped off her dirty clothes and threw them in the laundry basket before taking a shower and scrubbing off all the coal dust. Her last thought before she fell asleep was that she was actually relieved she could leave this messy and dreadful case alone. Next day Agatha went to a printer's, where she got a flyer she'd run off on her computer enlarged. She collected two hundred copies, and spent an afternoon posting them up in shop windows and on trees, in Carsley and in the villages round about. When she returned home, John rang and said he'd be round in a few minutes. I've been thinking, he said as he walked in, that perhaps we've been neglecting the London end. We never found out who beat Tristan up in New Cross. Forget it, said Agatha. I've been told in no uncertain terms to keep away from everything and anything to do with the case. And by the way, that rambler I saw was Kosher, a respectable citizen. Why are you warned off? What's been happening? I may as well tell you. Agatha described the events of the night. John was hardly able to hear the rest of her story. He was laughing so hard. You are an idiot, he said finally. Thank goodness you didn't drag me into it. Not that I would have gone with you, but I haven't been warned off. I should think the warning applies to you as well. So you're just giving up? Have you ever given up before? No, but I've never been at such a dead end before. I tell you, John, I'm going to concentrate on these duck races and make it all a success for Mrs. Bloxby, and then find something safe and pleasant to do with my time. Like what? I'll think of something. I think I'll go back up to London, said John, and see what I can find out. Want to come with me? Agatha shook her head. I've given up. Chapter 9 The day of the duck races was fine. Hazy sunshine gilded the countryside. Agatha was there early to supervise the arrangements. John had said he would join her later. Miss Sims was to sell programmes at the field gate. Six races were to be run. The entrance fee was one pound, but as Agatha had put a sign up on the main road saying free drinks, she was sure that the entrance charge would not deter the crowd. The free drinks were to be fruit punch laced with Miss Jellop's wine. The bottles of wine could be bought for three pounds each. The ducks, for anyone wanting to take part in the race, were to be sold for two pounds each. One of Miss Sims's ex-lovers, a bookie, had volunteered to take the racing bets. Agatha had donated small engraved silver cups to be given to the winner of each race. Agatha was glad the day was warm, because the three men who had volunteered to start the duck races would have to stand in the stream in their bare feet to lift the restraining plank across the stream which held the ducks at the starting line. Agatha was glad she trusted the weather report and had cancelled the marquee. The day looked set fair without a breath of wind. 
The sun sparkled on the rushing stream and shone on the red and yellow leaves of the trees bordering the field. Some of the local farmers, along with Farmer Brent, had set up tables to sell meat and local vegetables. Mrs. Tremp had two tables, one with homemade jam and the other with cakes. Agatha mixed fruit juice and two bottles of Miss Jellop's wine into a giant punch bowl ready to be ladled into small plastic cups. The event was to start at ten. A small trickle of people began to enter the field. Agatha noticed old Mrs. Feathers. Why didn't I think to question her about Tristan, she wondered. But deep down she knew it was because Mrs. Feathers was old and frail, and Agatha was ashamed when she remembered the trouble the old woman had gone to producing that expensive dinner. More people arrived, and Agatha was suddenly very busy ladling out punch and selling wine. John appeared, and she appealed to him for help, because a large crowd of people were demanding punch. Although Agatha had vowed to have nothing more to do with the case, she could not help turning over what she knew in her mind. There were noisy cheers from the stream where the races were taking place. The bookie was doing well, taking bets. After the first hour, Mrs. Tramp had sold practically everything. More and more people were arriving, drawn by the offer of free drink. Agatha began to feel marginalised. After all, she had paid for the cups. She should be the one to present them. But it was Mrs. Bloxby who was making the presentations. Agatha tried to console herself with the thought that the day had turned out to be a roaring success. But the press were there in force, and she was getting none of the glory. John tugged out his mobile phone. Well, be a moment, he said, just phoning home to see if there are any messages. All right, but hurry up, said Agatha sulkily. Then she thought about mobile phones. What have people ever done without them? A thin woman a little away from her was shouting into one. Doesn't need a phone, thought Agatha. Her voice is loud enough to carry miles. And then she stood with her mouth a little open, the ladle in her hand, while a customer looked at her impatiently. Had Tristan had a mobile phone? If he had, could someone have phoned him the night he died and threatened him? But the police would have found it and checked the numbers. Are you going to give me any of that punch or not? demanded a man in front of her. Sure. Agatha ladled some into a cup. She realised she'd served the same man about five times before. The crowd was getting noisy and boisterous. Agatha, seeing the punch bowl was nearly empty, added a bottle of wine and fruit juice to fill it up again. Perhaps two bottles of the stuff had been too strong. A team of Morris dancers had just arrived in their flowered hats and jingling bells and started buying bottles of wine. I don't have a spare corkscrew, said Agatha uneasily. She had not imagined that anyone would drink that lethal stuff until they got home. Got one here, said a red-faced Boris dancer, and his friends all cheered. Over the tannoy came an announcement that there would be a break for lunch. Agatha picked a placard off the ground at her feet which said, Closed for lunch, and placed it on the table. Do you think anyone will pinch anything? asked John. We'll put the bottles back in the boxes for now and tape them over. The members of the ladies' societies had set up a buffet at the far corner of the field and had laid out tables and chairs. Mrs. Broxby came up to Agatha, her eyes shining. Such a success, she said. We were going to confine it to six races, but we've decided to hold more in the afternoon and finish with the Morris dancers. What about prizes? asked Agatha. Surely all the cups have gone. I thought we might present each winner with two bottles of wine. Good idea, said Agatha, in a flat voice, because she still thought that she should have been the one to present the prizes. And seeing as the organisation has been largely done by you, Mrs. Raisin, I thought it would be nice if you could address the crowd at the end. Agatha brightened visibly. When Mrs. Bloxby had left, John said, What now? Do we go over there and fight for something to eat? I wonder if you could get me a plate of something, John. I want to speak to Mrs. Feathers. What about? he demanded sharply. I thought you'd given up. Just one question. I'll tell you later. Agatha began to search. Mrs. Feathers was not with the lunch crowd, nor among the people still crowding in front of the farmer's stores, Agatha being the only one who had packed up for lunch. 
and then she saw her grey head bobbing along in the direction of the gate. She ran after her, shouting, Mrs. Feathers! The old lady turned around slowly, blinking in the sunlight. Oh, it's you, Mrs. Raisin. Lovely day. Yes, it is. We're very lucky. Mrs. Feathers, did Tristan have a mobile phone? I was sure he had, but I must have been mistaken. He always used mine. What makes you think he had one? I went into his flat one day when I thought he was out to change the bed linen, but he was in and he was using a mobile phone. He put it away quickly when he saw me. Later, when he came down to use the phone, I asked him why he didn't use his own phone, and he said it had been a friend's and he'd returned it. It was a terrible business, that murder. It really shook me up. And Tristan never at any time said anything that you might think would give the police a clue to his murder? Oh, no, they've asked me and asked me. Dear Tristan, he said I was like a mother to him. I'm sure you were, said Agatha. When's the funeral? That took place some time ago. A cousin arranged it. Brat, thought Agatha. I'd forgotten all about the funeral. But what good would that have done me? Do you have a name and address for this cousin? Reckon as how you'll need to ask the police, my dear. They took away all his stuff, and then I think they sent it on to the cousin. Agatha thanked her, and was about to turn away when she saw Bill and Alice just paying their entrance fees. Bill, said Agatha, approaching him, could I have a word? What about? demanded Alice. Agatha looked at Bill pleadingly. It's a police matter. All right, Alice, go and see if there's anything at the stall that Mother would like. Alice shot Agatha a venomous look and trudged off. Agatha told Bill about the mobile phone. Good work, he said. I'll get them onto it. They can check all the mobile phone companies and see which one he was registered with. But I thought I told you to stop investigating. It just came up in conversation with Mrs. Feathers, said Agatha. Oh, here's your beloved back again. I want a drink, said Alice, but that stall is closed. God forgive me for what I'm about to do, thought Agatha. I'll get you a drink, Alice. She went to her stall and drew the cork on a bottle of homemade wine while Bill had pulled out his mobile and was phoning headquarters. She picked up one of the large tumblers she'd kept for people who only wanted fruit juice and filled it up. I'd tell Bill that's just punch, said Agatha. It's pretty strong stuff. I can drink any man under the table, sneered Alice. She went back to join Bill. John came back with a plate of ham and salad, which he handed to Agatha. Thanks, she said. What's going on? asked John. When I was queuing up, I saw you talking to Bill, and he looked very serious. Agatha told him about the mobile phone. That might be something, said John. Say he had his phone beside the bed. Someone phones him after you left and frightens him. He decides to make a run for it, but first of all he thinks he'll take that money out of the church box. Whoever threatened him is watching the house, follows into the vicar's study and stabs him. Could be. Oh, they're starting up again and I haven't had time to eat. You go ahead. I'll cope with the first lot and then you can take over so that I can eat something. Agatha walked over towards the duck races, carrying her plate. People were cheering on the ducks, bets were being laid, the little yellow plastic ducks were bobbing down the stream, occasionally swirling round in the eddies. Agatha found it too difficult to eat with just one plastic fork, so she headed for the lunch tables and found a chair. A little way away from her, the Morris men were downing glasses of Miss Jellop's wine, their faces flushed and their voices loud. Mrs. Raisin? It is Agatha Raisin, isn't it? Agatha looks up. A pretty young woman was standing over her, holding a child by the hand. With a wrench of memory, Agatha said, Bunty, how are you? The woman seated next to Agatha moved away, and Bunty sat down and put the child on her knee. Bunty had been Agatha's last secretary before she retired. Is that yours? asked Agatha, pointing with her fork to the little girl Bunty was holding. Yes, this is Philippa. Who did you marry? Philip Jersey. Of Jersey Advertising? That's the one. After you packed up and retired, I took a job as his secretary. Agatha frowned. I thought he was married. Yes, he was, then. Did he get a divorce to marry you? 
asked Agatha, ever curious. Yes, I feel guilty about it, but I was mad about him. Still am. I took my time about saying yes. You know how it is, Agatha's secretaries and bosses. It gets like a marriage. You get to know them better than their wives. Was it a bitter divorce? Not too bad. Cost him a lot, though. But there were no children. We've got a place over in silence that we use for weekends. Give Philippa here some country air. And what about you? I see your name from time to time in the newspapers. Death does seem to follow you around. She looked at the ring, sparkling on Agatha's finger. Are you married? I was. I'm divorced. I still wear my rings. Agatha did not want to talk about John. Bunty looked around. It all looks so peaceful here. You wouldn't think there'd been any murders in such a quiet rural spot. Have the police any idea who did it? Agatha shook her head. Philippa squirmed on her mother's knee. I want to see the darks, she wailed. I'd better take her or I'll get no peace. Bunty rose to her feet. Nice to see you again. Agatha saw Alice sitting a little way away on her own, drinking wine. She must have bought a whole bottle from John. There was no sign of Bill. He was probably off somewhere phoning to see if there was any news about that mobile phone. She finished her food and went back to where John was ladling up punch. We'd better stop selling that wine, he said when he saw her. The Morris men won't be able to dance if they have any more. Are we selling much? Yes, has quite a lot, but people are mostly taking it home. We'll put the bottles on the table in the boxes, and if the Morris men come back, tell them we're sold out and we'll keep on selling it when they go away. The afternoon wore on, and a chill crept into the air. Mrs. Broxby came up. The Morris men are getting ready to perform, and then it's your speech, Agatha. You may as well close up here. You've done splendidly. Agatha thankfully put a closed sign on the table, and she and John put the remaining plastic cups in a box. They walked to where the crowd was gathering to watch the Morris men. Bill and Alice were standing just behind the crowd, and Alice was red-faced and shouting at him, You're nothing but a mother's boy! Let's go round the other side. I don't want to listen to this, said Agatha. She felt guilty. She should have warned Alice about the effects of the wine. They found a space where they could watch the Morris men. Alf Bloxby's voice sounded over the crowd. We will now see a performance of the stick dance by the Merchester Morris men. Morris dancing is one of the characteristic folk dances of England. We do not know its origins, although we know it was derived from agrarian traditions of fertility rites and celebrations at sowing and at harvest time. A Morris man fell over and lay on the grass. Though well known during Shakespeare's time, continued the vicar, it almost died out during the Industrial Revolution, but has now thankfully been revived. You will enjoy the colourful sight of the dancers with their bells and waving hankies, dancing to tunes played on the fiddle, pipe and tabor and melodeon. Over to you, boys. The Morris man who had fallen over was dragged to his feet, and he stood there blinking in the fading sunlight. A tape was put into a player, and the jingly, jaunty tune of Morris music sounded out. The dancers, with flowers in their hats and silver bells at their knees, clutched their sticks and faced each other. They were supposed to bang their crossed sticks as they met in the dance, but two of them missed and hit their opposite number a thwack. "'You did that a purpose, Fred!' yelled one, and seizing his stick brought it down on the unfortunate Fred's head, Soon the dance had degenerated into a rumble. Alf Bloxby tried to separate the warring dancers, but was thrust aside with cries of, Get away, you murderer! The vicar, his face flaming, looked around for help, shouting to the crowd to stop laughing and do something. Police! shouted Bill Wong. Alf switched off the music. The dancers stopped hitting each other and stood there sheepishly. Bill shouted to the crowd, All of you, go home! Show's over. The crowd began to stream off towards the gate. My speech, wailed Agatha. Too late, said John. We'd better get back and start loading up the rest of the wine and stuff. John had borrowed a trailer, which was hitched to his car, parked at the edge of the field. John stared at the ground behind the table. Agatha, the wine's gone. 
someone's nicked the rest of it. I don't care, said Agatha, I hope it poisons them. But we'd better tell Bill. Bill's got his hands full. He didn't leave the money behind. No, I've got it here in a bag. We'll count it out at home and then take it along to the vicarage. Are you sure you don't want to report the missing wine? I'm sure. Just let's hope it wasn't a married couple who took it. A few slugs of that wine and they'll be in the divorce courts in no time at all. I don't like Alice, but I should have never let her drink that wine. Better Bill finds out what she's really like now instead of later, said John. Hurry up and help me, Agatha, it's getting cold. The sun had turned red and was low on the horizon. They loaded up the trailer with the remainder of the plastic cups, the glasses, the punch bowl, and then the table itself. As they drove out of the field, Agatha said, I should have told Bill as well about Brent and his wife. I really don't think they had anything to do with it, Agatha. Someone had. Someone somewhere. Someone who could have been at this very fate. They drove to the church hall first and carried the table in. There was still plenty of wine stacked in boxes. Just as well we didn't take the whole lot along, said John. Where did you get the punch bowl from? I bought it. No one could call you mean, Agatha Raisin. Must have cost you a lot, what with the silver cups and all. Just doing my bit, said Agatha wearily. We'll Bill book for Morris dancers. No, I think you'd give them a warning and tell them not to dare drive until they've sobered up. That's all right, they hired a minibus. As long as the bus driver didn't have any of the wine, they'll be all right. We leave the cups and glasses here, said Agatha. They can be used another time. I was too upset to notice. I hope the press had all gone by the time the dancers started fighting. Sorry, there was at least one television camera in action, and I saw two press photographers. Damn. Let's go to my place and have a drink. No, mine, said Agatha. I want to let my cats out. After they'd finished their drinks, they counted out the money on the kitchen table. Nearly one hundred and fifty pounds, and that for the wine alone, said John. Not bad. There must have been only about two boxes of wine left for them to steal. Miss Jellop must have brought most of the wine down here with her when she moved. It must have taken years to make a cellar full of the stuff, said Agatha. Let's take this money along to Mrs. Bloxby. She could raise a lot of money for the church with the wine that's left. But I think someone in the village who knows about homemade wine should figure out how to weaken it before any more is sold. At least that should be the end of Alice. I never could figure out what Bill saw in her. Maybe she's good in bed. Agatha shuddered. For some reason she did not want to imagine Bill Wong in bed with anyone, least of all Alice. Mrs. Boxby welcomed them at the vicarage and took the bag of money from John. I'll give this to Alf. He's in his study counting out the takings. From the initial look of things we've done very well. It's all thanks to you, Agatha, and Alf is going to say so in his sermon next Sunday. I saw you talking to old Mrs. Feathers. Did she have anything interesting to say? I should have spoken to her before, said Agatha. She said she'd be sure Tristan had a mobile phone. And how does that help? Because Mrs. Feathers said he had no calls the night after I left. But if, say, he had a mobile in his bedroom, someone could have rung him up and threatened him. He could have decided to flee, and decided at the same time to take the church takings with him. He was too mean, I think, to let Mrs. Feathers know he had a phone of his own. He preferred to run up bills on hers. Did you tell Bill? Yes, for once I did. He's getting the police to check it. If only, if only these murders could be solved. If they ever are, said Agatha, I'll never complain of being bored again. But Bill has definitely warned me off for the last time, so I'll need to leave it to the police. He didn't warn me off, John pointed out. But Agatha didn't like the idea of John playing detective when she herself was not allowed to. Mind you, she said, there would be no harm in continuing to ask around the village. Look at the news I got from Mrs. Feathers. Might do no harm to go and talk to Mr. Crinstead, the man Tristan used to play chess with. I'll come with you, said John. We'll try him in the morning. What do you know of Mark Brent? Agatha asked Mrs. Bloxby. Nothing bad. Nice man, always willing to help out. Why? He was upset with Tristan. Seems his wife Gladys got a crush on Tristan and Brent warned him off. I cannot imagine for a moment that such as Mr. Brent or his wife would resort to violence of any kind, said Mrs. Bloxby. Well, we'll try Mr. Crinstead. 
Oh, and the mobile library is due round during the week. I'll have a word with Mrs. Brown. Do you think it will do any good? asked the vicar's wife wearily. Agatha could feel a resurgence of her old energy for investigation which had so recently deserted her. I've blundered around asking questions before. Something's got to break. Agatha and John drove to the council estate on Monday morning. Do you think he'll be at home? asked John. He's very old, replied Agatha, bound to be. Mr. Quinstead answered the door to them. He was stooped and frail with a thin, lined face and mild eyes behind thick glasses. Do come in, he said. Dear me, how nice to have some company. The only company I usually have is the television set. His living room was neat and clean. Agatha looked at photographs on the mantelpiece of couples with children. How many children do you have? she asked. A son and daughter and six grandchildren. Must be nice for you when they come on a visit. I'm afraid I only see them at Christmas. I think they find visits to me rather boring. The children are dreadfully spoiled. How awful, thought Agatha, to be trapped here, never seeing anyone. Her mind worked busily. She would suggest to Mrs. Bloxby that they start an old folks club. Her stocks and shares have been doing very well. Maybe she could see about getting the church hall renovated, turn it into an old folks club. The reason we called, said John, is to ask you for your opinion of Tristan Delon. Oh, dear. Do sit down. I'll make some tea. Agatha glanced at her watch. Don't worry. It's nearly lunchtime. Tell you what, we'll chat for a bit, and then we'll go down to Morton for some lunch. My treat. John stared at Agatha in surprise, but Mr. Crimstead was obviously delighted. Goodness me, it does seem an age since I've been out of the village. So what can I tell you about our late curate? Well, he called round one day when I was working out some chess moves and offered to play. I was so delighted to have a partner that I let him win on a couple of occasions. He was such good company. I thought he really liked me, and that was very flattering to an old man like me. Then the last time I became absorbed in the game and forgot to let him win. I have never in my life before seen anyone change personality so completely. He accused me of cheating. I patiently began to explain to him the moves I had made, and he said, You're lying, you silly old fool. Then he upset the chessboard and sent the pieces flying and stalked out of the house. I was very disappointed. You see, I did think we might be friends. Before he became upset with you, said John, did he let fall anything about his private life? Not really. Chess is such a silent game. He did say once that people were like chess pieces easily moved around. I pointed out that people could be very unpredictable. Let's continue this over lunch, said Agatha. They went to a pub in Morton and ate great helpings of steak and kidney pie. Agatha ordered wine. To John's amazement, she sparkled for Mr. Quinstead's benefit, telling him stories about her public relations jobs. Warmed by the wine and food, Mr. Quinstead talked in turn about his own life. He had been a nuclear physicist working at Los Alamos, and then in Vienna. He'd married an Austrian wife, Gerda, but she'd died of breast cancer after their second child was born. I spent a lot of money sending my son and daughter to the best schools and then university, Frida, my daughter, became a nurse and then married a doctor. My son, Gerald, he became an accountant and married his secretary. Mr. Quinstead sighed. I never saved any money, and I was lucky to get that council house. I have a comfortable pension, and my needs are small. I'm glad both my children are very comfortably off. Don't they help you out? asked John. I never ask them. I don't have any expensive needs. Perhaps I did too much for them and taught them to be selfish. You know the church hall? asked Agatha. I know where it is, but that's all. I thought I might see about getting it repaired. The roof needs doing. I could start an old folks club. Films, bingo, stuff like that. You could give chess lessons. We'd need a minibus, too, to take people to the shops in Stratford. Maybe the theatre. That would be wonderful. I would love to give chess lessons. Again John looked at Agatha in surprise. He had recently come to think of her as a bossy, occasionally grumpy woman, but her eyes were sparkling with enthusiasm, and old Mr. Quinstead looked positively rejuvenated. 
He had to remind her after two hours of conversation that if they didn't hurry up, they would miss the mobile library. After they'd left Mr. Crimstead, John said, Are you really going ahead with this old folks club? Yes, it'll be fun to have something to do. You surprise me. I can believe that. You have me down as a pushy, selfish woman. I have not, said John, reddening. There's the mobile library. Let's see what Mrs. Brown has to say. They had to wait patiently while various villagers returned books, took out more books, and discussed books. At last they were left alone with Mrs. Brown. Mr. Delon? Mrs. Brown looked at them thoughtfully over her half-moon glasses. Now there was a young man just waiting to be murdered. Why do you say that? asked John. The plump little librarian picked a book off her desk and put it back on the shelves. I have often thought about the way he humiliated me, jeering at my choice of books. There was no reason for it. It was an exercise in spite. I thought after I'd heard he had been murdered that if he could be bothered to go out of his way to be nasty to a country librarian, then he'd probably been extremely nasty to someone who was prepared to retaliate. Then you can think of no reason why he should suddenly have sounded off at you? asked Agatha. There was one silly little thing. Mrs. Feathers likes romances, so I always choose one of the more innocent ones and keep it for her. She doesn't like the ones with explicit sex. We got talking one day, and she said that Mr. DeLong wanted to invest her savings for her. I told her that she should hang on to them. Mr. DeLong was not a stockbroker. Perhaps that was what made him angry. But when Mrs. Feathers thanked me for my advice, I asked her not to tell Mr. DeLong it came from me, and she promised me she wouldn't tell him. That is why I thought his malice was unprompted. I think she probably did tell him, said Agatha. What's the gossip about these murders? I'm afraid a lot of people still suspect the vicar. They say Mr. DeLon was murdered in the vicarage, and that Miss Jellop and Mrs. Slither may have known something incriminating, and Mr. Bloxby might have silenced them. It's ridiculous, I know, but frightened people do talk such rubbish, and people are frightened. I see the duck races made the front page of the Daily Bugle. I haven't seen the papers today, said Agatha. Have you got a copy? Yes, I've one in my desk. Mrs. Brown pulled open a drawer. Here it is. There was a coloured photograph of the Morris men fighting. The headline read, The Peace of the English Countryside. Oh, dear, said Agatha. Never mind, we raised quite a bit of money. There was nothing more about Tristan to be got from Mrs. Brown. Two more dead ends, said John when he dropped Agatha off at her cottage. Now what? I'm going back to see Mrs. Bloxby, said Agatha. I'm going to put forward my idea for the old folks' club. You're on your own, then. Maybe see you tomorrow. Yes, maybe, said Agatha vaguely, her mind full of plans. It really is too generous of you, Mrs. Raisin, said Mrs. Bloxby. But what about all that wine? We need to find a new home for it. I've had an idea about that, said Agatha. The wine is very heavy and sweet. We could relabel it and call it Cotswold Liqueur. I could ask John Fletcher if he would buy the wine. He could sell it by the glass as a liqueur. I could get a write-up on it in the local paper, do a bit of promotion in return, tell him the proceeds will go to the old folks' home. That's a brilliant idea. I don't think all your money should go into the repairs. Now we've done so well to save the children, I think we should organise the next fundraising venture to go to repairing the hall. I'll think of something good, said Agatha confidently. I'm so glad to see you looking like your old self, said Mrs. Bloxby. I think I've finally got fed up with suffering over James. I'm going to have fun. Agatha was hungry when she got home. Once more she scrabbled in the deep freeze, scraping frost off labels in her search for something to eat. She was so tired she did not notice that the tray of faggots she placed in the microwave was on a foil dish. She had not read the instructions properly, and so did not know that foil was deemed unsuitable for microwaves. She had only read the time by dint of screwing up her eyes. Agatha should have realised that forty-five minutes in a microwave is a long time. While the dish spun round, she went into the garden and took a deep breath of the cold night air. Was the murderer somewhere in the village? Was it possible to sleep easy at night after having committed three murders? As she stood there lost in thought, 
she finally became aware of the frantic mewing of her cats and turned round. Black smoke was billowing out through the open kitchen door. She rushed in. Flames were beginning to look around the inside of the microwave. She switched it off and unplugged it and opened the door, coughing and waving her arms to try to clear the smoke. The foil tray had melted under a congealed black heap of food. Agatha lifted up the microwave and put it outside the kitchen door. She found some slightly hard bread and cut two slices and toasted them with cheese under the grill. A film of black was lying over all the surfaces in the kitchen. When she'd finished eating, she began to clean the kitchen. It was nearly midnight by the time she had finished. Agatha went upstairs and had a hot bath and then changed into a long cotton nightdress. She climbed into bed and settled down with a weary sigh. What a day! At least the duck races had raised a lot of money. Pity about the bad publicity. So Bunty was married. She had achieved the dream of many secretaries by marrying the boss. Agatha's thoughts drifted back to the days when she herself had been a secretary. Her boss, an advertising manager, had been tall and blonde and charming. Agatha had slavishly spent some of her small pay packet on buying special brands of coffee to please him, but he never seemed to pay any more attention to her than if she were some sort of piece of office machinery. Mr. Crinstead's son had married his secretary. She sat up, her mind racing. Miss Portal, Binsa's secretary. What if she was so in love with her boss that she would defend him every way she could? This book is continued on Disc 5. Disc 5 Chapter 10 Without even bothering to put on a dressing gown, Agatha fled down the stairs, out into the night, straight to John's cottage, and rang the bell and then hammered on the door. I'm coming! she heard John's cross voice shouting. He opened the door and stared at Agatha in her nightgown. Why, Agatha, this is so sudden. Don't be silly, said Agatha, I've just got to talk to you. He stood back and she walked into his living room. John was bare-chested, wearing only a pair of blue silk pyjama trousers. His smooth chest was strong and muscled. Agatha wondered briefly what he did to keep so fit before plunging in. Secretaries, she gasped. Sit down, calm down, begin at the beginning. I met my former secretary, Bunty, at the duck races. She'd married her boss, mad about him. That's nice, said John soothingly. But why come dashing in here in the middle of the night? I just remembered how secretaries can obsess about their bosses. What about Miss Partle? Bincer's secretary? Yes, her. Do you remember it was because of her that Bincer met Tristan in the first place? I think I do. Well, think of this. She could have been charmed by Tristan, enough to affect the introduction, but her real passion was for her boss. When Tristan conned Bincer out of ten thousand, she must have been determined to get it back. She may have arranged to get him beaten up. So the ten thousand is returned. Still, Tristan tried a bit of blackmail. He loved money. He was desperate for money and more money. Miss Partle thought it was all over. But somehow, Tristan gets his hands on a real piece of blackmail material concerning Bincer. He phones Miss Partle. So he speaks to her because Bincer is away. She decides to silence him. She phones him in the middle of the night after I leave. Maybe she reminds Tristan of the beating in New Cross. He decides to make a break for it. He leaves the house and goes to the vicarage. She follows him quietly, not wanting to attack him in the street. Let's say he doesn't use his key to the vicarage, but goes through the French windows. She sees him open the church box and take the money. She suddenly sees it would be to her advantage to get rid of him in such circumstances. She seizes the paper knife and bingo. And what about Peggy Slither and Miss Jellop? Tristan must have told them about what he had on Bincer, or hinted at it. Miss Jellop, upset at his death, decides to phone Miss Portal. Maybe she thinks Miss Jellop knew more than she did. Same with Peggy. She panics. Two more murders. Agatha! Agatha, think calmly. It's all too improbable. You're clutching at straws. Nevertheless, I'm going up there tomorrow, and I'm going to have a word with her and see her reaction. She can't do anything to me in a busy office. John was about to point out that Bincer's offices were in a quiet executive suite, but restrained himself. Go back to bed, he said soothingly. We'll talk about it tomorrow. Maybe I won't confront her right away, said Agatha. I'll follow her after work, see where she lives, try to find out what sort of person she is. 
Yes, dear, just go home, said John, as if humouring a child. So you aren't coming with me? Unknown to Agatha, John had a dinner date for the following evening with Charlotte Bellinge, but he wasn't going to tell Agatha that. I have a book to finish. Very well, said Agatha huffily. I'll investigate on my own. Agatha decided to be in London when Bincer's offices closed for the night. That way she could follow Miss Partle, see where she lived, perhaps get some idea of her real character. She put on a disguise she had worn before of a blonde wig and spectacles with non-magnifying lenses. Before she went, she was tempted to phone Bill, but then she remembered John's sheer disbelief at her deductions and realised Bill would probably feel the same. Once at Bincer's offices, she took one of the many seats in the large reception area, confident that no one would ask her what she was doing there. People came and went, and the seats around her began to empty. Staff began to pour out of the building. The receptionists began to pack up for the night, their places being taken by two security guards. Agatha knew she was beginning to look conspicuous, and so she left and lurked outside. Time dragged on. A cold wind blew along Cheapside. Then suddenly Miss Partle appeared. Agatha sighed with relief. She had been worried that Miss Partle might be wearing a hat or something that might make her difficult to recognise. Keeping well behind her, Agatha followed Miss Partle along to St Paul's Tube and then down the long escalators to the central line platform. Now what to do, she wondered. Get into the same carriage? Why not, she decided. Miss Partle would not recognise her, disguised as she was. They were travelling west. The carriage was crowded. Agatha strap hung, peering occasionally through the press of bodies to where Miss Partle was standing farther down the carriage. The secretary got out at Notting Hill Gate, and Agatha doggedly followed her. Miss Partle went quickly along Pembridge Road, and to Agatha's disappointment went into a Turkish restaurant. Still I'm disguised, and I may as well eat something, thought Agatha. The restaurant was quiet. Agatha was placed three tables away from Miss Partle. The secretary took the evening standard out of her briefcase and began to read. Agatha ordered kebab and rice and a glass of house wine. The restaurant began to fill up. Finally, Miss Partle finished eating and reading and called for her bill. Agatha did the same. As Miss Partle was paying her bill, Agatha was overcome by a desire to pee. Cursing, she dived down the stairs to the toilet. When she emerged upstairs again, it was to find Miss Partle gone. Agatha paid her bill and rushed out into the night, looking to right and left. She saw the figure of Miss Partle turning left into Chepstow Villas and set off in pursuit. She paused at the end of the street and looked along. The sturdy figure of Miss Partle moved from pool of lamplight to pool of lamplight. Apart from a woman walking her dog, the street was empty. Then Agatha saw Miss Partle turn in at the gate of one of the early Victorian houses. It had a holly tree at the gate. Agatha waited and then walked slowly along, and once outside looked up at the house, wondering what to do next. She'd learned nothing. Miss Partle had met no one, talked to no one. Agatha knew as little about her as she'd always done. She missed John. She missed someone to talk to. She took a notebook out of her handbag and made a note of the address. Perhaps she should check into a hotel for the night and try again next day. Try what? jeered a voice in her head. The more Agatha stood there and thought about Miss Partle being the killer, the more ridiculous it began to seem. She decided to go home. After all, she hadn't told Doris Simpson to look after her cats. She had left dried food out for them, which her spoiled cats hated. No, it was time to go home and leave it all to the police. John Armitage had endured a humiliating evening. He had arranged to meet Charlotte in a smart restaurant in the King's Road. Charlotte had turned up half an hour late, accompanied by a handsome young man. This is Giles, she said. Giles, John Armitage. You don't mind if Giles joins us, do you, darling? So John, who had hoped for a romantic evening, was forced to entertain Giles as well as Charlotte, and Giles was a man of few words. Apart from saying he thought reading books was a waste of time, he drank a lot and said little else. John began to hope that when the meal was over, maybe Charlotte would get rid of this boring young man and invite him home. The price of the meal made him blink. That ever hopefully paid up. To his chagrin, once outside the restaurant, 
Charlotte thanked him firmly but sweetly for dinner, tucked her arm in Giles's, and walked off with him down the King's Road in the direction of her home. John cursed himself for a fool. He found himself missing Agatha. He would have been better off to have gone with her on whatever mad goose chase she was on. Agatha could be infuriating and bossy, but she was never boring. He tried to discuss the case with Charlotte, until he realized her beautiful eyes were glazing over with boredom. Charlotte, when not talking about herself, only liked to hear things she was interested in, like which restaurant or fashion designer was in and which was out. The lights were out in Agatha's cottage when he arrived home. He decided that on the following day he would drive to Merchester, where there was an excellent butcher, and buy some steak and invite Agatha for dinner. Agatha awoke next day with the beginning of a sniffle. She was afraid she must have caught a cold with all that hanging around Cheapside in the cold wind. But somehow her belief that the murderer might be Miss Partle was renewed. She paced up and down her kitchen. Perhaps the thing she should have done was simply to confront the woman and see if she betrayed herself in any way. Determination rose in her. She swept the morning's mail off the mat, including a note from John inviting her for dinner, and placed it on the hall table without looking at any of it. She served her cat's chopped lamb's liver, and then put a warm coat on and made her way out to the car. In London she parked her car in the underground car park at Hyde Park, and took the tube to Notting Hill Gate. The area was crowded as people made their way to the antiques market in the Portobello Road. Agatha went straight to the house in Chepstow Villas, and rang the bell and waited. There was no reply. She stood for a moment irresolute, and then decided to take a look at the stalls in the Portobello Market. It felt odd to be surrounded once more by the smells and crowds of London. Agatha walked from stall to stall, examining jewellery, military badges, and old clothes. She saw a handsome silver paper knife and decided to buy it for Alf Bloxby. He would need a new one. The stall owner wrapped it up in tissue paper, and Agatha slid it into her coat pocket. She was just making her way through the crowds, past a man with a hurdy-gurdy and with a parrot on his shoulder, when a voice in her ear said, Mrs. Raisin? Agatha swung round. There was Miss Partle surveying her. What a surprise, said Agatha. Isn't this market fascinating? It is, if you can tell fake from genuine, but I like looking, said Miss Partle. Like a coffee? Thanks, said Agatha. Where shall we go? It's so long since I've been here. I live close by. I was just going home. They walked together, chatting amiably about how London had changed, and all the while Agatha was thinking, I must have been mad to suspect this nice woman. In Chepstow Villas, Miss Partle unlocked the door. Agatha followed her into a sitting room which led off a narrow entrance corridor. It was furnished with good antiques and some fine paintings. The room, which had originally consisted of front and back parlours, was now one long room with long windows front and back. Miss Partle went to a thermostat on the wall and turned it up. Keep your coat on, it's chilly in here, but it will soon warm up. Come downstairs to the kitchen and I'll make coffee. This is a fine house, said Agatha, when they were downstairs looking around the gleaming modern kitchen. You've put a lot of work into it. I bought it with an inheritance from an aunt, back when Notting Hill was still pretty unfashionable, and got work done on it every time I could afford it. Take a seat, and tell me why you were following me yesterday in that strange disguise. The coffee will be ready in a minute. Agatha laughed. You were never going to believe this. I must have had a rush of blood to the head. I didn't know you had spotted me last night. That's a very distinctive ring you're wearing. You should have left it off. And the wind must have disarranged your wig. I noticed in the restaurant that a strand of brown hair had escaped. I studied you when you thought I wasn't looking, and finally I was able to place you, and then I saw you standing outside my house. So what were you doing? I may as well tell you. I hope you're not going to be too furious with me. It all started at the duck races. This sounds weird. Duck races? What has that got to do with me? No. Oh, the coffee's ready. How do you take it? It's just black. Do you mind if I smoke? Yes, I do. I'll live without one. Here's your coffee. Now tell me why you were following me. Well, at these duck races in the village, I met my former secretary, Bunty, who had married her boss. 
I got to thinking about secretaries who were in love with their bosses, and I thought if Mr. Binster had been under some sort of threat from Tristan, you might have stepped in to protect him. It all seems fantastic now I'm here talking to you. I should be angry, but I suppose three murders in and around your village must have made you want to grasp at straws. So the police have no leads? Not unless the one I've just given them comes to anything. And what was that? Mrs. Feathers, the elderly lady Tristan was living with, she told me she'd once seen him using a mobile phone. I told the police. You see, he might have got a phone call on the night he died that frightened him. I think he broke into the church box to take the money because he planned to make a run for it and wanted some petty cash. So if there was a call, they'll be able to trace who it was. A cloud crossed the sun, darkening the garden outside, where two starlings pecked for worms in the small lawn. You don't see many of them nowadays, said Agatha. What, mobile phones? No starlings. London used to be full of them. I was looking at the starlings on your lawn. Tell me about these duck races, said Miss Partle. It sounds very primitive. To wonder you didn't have the animal rights people after you or the Royal Society for the Protection of Birds. These were plastic ducks, the little yellow ones. Agatha told her all about the races and the drunken Morris men. I didn't realise there was so much fun to be had in a village, said Miss Partle. What on earth made you decide to poke around in murder? Insatiable curiosity, I guess, but I've no intention of giving up until I find out who did it. Well, you know what they say, curiosity killed a cat. Would you like to see the rest of the house? Not really, said Agatha. I think I'd better be getting back down to the country. You were talking about all that wine the dead woman's sister gave to the races. I've built up quite a cellar. Not homemade, mind. Good stuff. You have a cellar? Yes. Here. Miss Partle opened a door in the kitchen. Come on, you can choose a bottle. Agatha walked to the cellar door and peered down some stone steps. You go on down, said Miss Partle behind her. I'll just switch off the percolator. Is there a light switch, said Agatha? uneasily reminded of being trapped in Mrs. Tremp's coal cellar. On the inside of the door, on your right. Agatha was searching inside the door for the switch, when a massive blow struck her on the back of the head, and she fell headlong down the steps and lay in a heap at the bottom. Agatha could feel pain all over, though she was still conscious. But as she heard Miss Partle coming down the stairs, with what was left of her wits, she realised she'd better look as if she were unconscious and she felt her ankles being bound, and then her wrists. A piece of strong adhesive tape was put over her mouth. Interfering bitch! hissed Miss Partle. I thought that phone had been got rid of. I phoned from a call box round the corner. I hope they don't realise the phone box is near where I live. What'll I do now? I'll be back. Oh, God, why couldn't you leave things alone? Agatha heard her footsteps mounting the stairs, and then the cellar door banged shut. At first Agatha was in such a state of pain and fright that her brain did not seem to be able to work at all. Then she thought dismally that she should have told Bill her suspicions. When she went missing, John would tell him, and he would then question Miss Partle, and maybe her body would be found. John Armitage carried his groceries to his car, parked in the public car park in front of Merchester Police Headquarters. Bill Wong hailed him. On your own, where's your fiancé? For one split second, John wondered whom he was talking about, and then rallied and said, Oh, Agatha, she must still be up in London. Any luck with that mobile phone? There was a call to him the night he was murdered. It came from a call box in Notting Hill. Pity. Look, Bill, I hope she isn't getting herself into trouble. You'd better tell me. It's just that she had this mad idea that the murderer was Miss Partle, you know, Bimser's secretary. Why on earth should she think that? It's because she met her former secretary at the duck races. Former secretary married her boss. Agatha starts thinking about secretaries who are in love with their bosses, and comes to the mad conclusion that the respectable Miss Partle must have gone around bumping off people to protect Bimser. I just hope she doesn't get into trouble. She's gone to find out about her. Bimser's got powerful friends. Bill stood very still. I've often thought, he said slowly, and although Agatha might sometimes do silly things, she is possessed of an almost psychic ability to leap to the right conclusions. John looked unconvinced. Unless Miss Partle has any connection with Notting Hill, the whole idea remains far-fetched. 
I have the addresses of everyone concerned with the murder cases in the station, said Bill. Do no harm to have a look. I'll come with you. All right. Bill led the way into police headquarters and told John to take a seat and wait. John waited and waited, feeling increasingly uneasy. Bill was taking an unusually long time. At last, Bill came out. Miss Portal lives in Notting Hill, he said. I phoned Kensington to pull her in for questioning just in case and hope Binser doesn't sue us. Give me the address, said John. No, one amateur is enough. Leave it to the police. John raced to the post office and asked for the London phone directory. He located Miss Partle's address, got back into his car, and set off at speed for London. Agatha was in a state of sheer terror. For a long time she was unable to think. Then she remembered that paper knife she had bought and put in the pocket of her coat. She twisted her bound hands trying to get her fingers inside her coat pocket. Then the cellar door opened again. This is it, thought Agatha. Miss Pardle came down the stairs, carrying a hammer. I'll just put an end to you, she said, and then worry about getting rid of the body later. She hefted the hammer, and Agatha closed her eyes. Then above their heads the doorbell shrilled. Miss Pardle lowered the hammer. Should she answer it or wait for them to go away? But sometimes Mr. Binser sent important documents to her home for her to study. She dropped the hammer on the floor beside Agatha and went back up the stairs. She opened the street door. Two policemen stood there. Miss Partle? Yes? I wonder if you would accompany us to the police station. Just a few more questions concerning the murder of Tristan Delon. But I have already answered all your questions. Mr. Binser will be most displeased. It won't take long. The desire to get them away from the house prompted Miss Partle to say, I'll fetch my handbag. Agatha heard the voices but could not make out what they were saying. She heard Miss Partle go back into the kitchen and then back to the front door. Agatha began to bang her feet on the floor. But the door slammed shut behind Miss Partle, and the house was quiet. Bill and Detective Chief Inspector Wilkes were speeding for London, siren blaring. I told them to hold this Miss Partle until we got there, said Wilkes. Oh, you've been thinking, said Bill. What if Agatha has gone to her house? They say she seemed to be alone. Might be an idea to call at the house first and ask the neighbours if they saw anyone like Agatha call at the door. Only take a minute, he pleaded. Wilkes sighed. Well, all right, but I've got a feeling we'll have Binser's lawyers on top of us by the end of the day. Agatha Raisin. Pah! Why can't she mind her own business? She's often blundered onto something in the past. If there's nothing in this, I'll charge that dumb woman with interfering in police business, and I really will do it this time. Down in the cellar, Agatha rolled onto her back again with a groan. Why wasn't real life like the movies? In a movie, the heroine would have been able to get her hands on that knife and free her bonds. She lay still for a moment and tried again. Her pockets were deep. She got a finger on the edge of the tissue paper and gently tugged. Bit by bit, the knife began to emerge from her pocket. She gave a final tug, and the knife in its tissue paper wrapping popped out and fell on the floor. She rolled on her side and felt for it. But the tissue paper wrapping had been cello-taped around the knife, and she could not get enough movement in her fingers to tear it off. Tears began to roll down her cheeks. John Armitage was caught up in a traffic jam. He heard the sound of a police siren and saw the cars in front twist to the side of the road. A police car roared past. He got a glimpse of Bill Wong's face. He suddenly felt that Agatha had made a terrible mistake, and the police would never forgive her. This is the house, said Bill. Let's try next door and find out if Agatha's been seen. A young woman with two children hanging on her skirts opened the door. Bill described Agatha. She shook her head. I've been busy with the children. I've called Mrs. Wirtle across the street. She never misses anything. Mrs. Wirtle took ages to answer the door. She was leaning on a Zimmer frame, peering up at them from under a bird's nest of uncombed grey hair. Once more, Bill described Agatha. Yes, I saw a woman like that go in with Miss Partle, said Mrs. Wirtle. Then Miss Partle was taken away by the police. What's going on? And you did not see the other woman come out, demanded Bill in a loud voice. 
No need to shout, I'm not deaf. No, I didn't see her. They thanked her and went and stood in front of Miss Partle's house. Might take too long to get a search warrant, said Wilkes. Try the door, suggested Bill. Wilkes turned the handle. It's open. Then we can go in, said Bill. Responsible policemen checking on locked premises. Agatha heard men's voices, had Miss Partle associates, but she was desperate. She made choking noises behind her gag and banged her feet on the floor. You hear something? asked Bill as they stood in the narrow entrance corridor. They stood and listened. Again a faint banging sound followed by a moan. They walked down to the kitchen. Agatha! called Bill sharply. A stifled, gurgling moan. That door over there is open, said Bill. He fumbled inside the door and located the light switch and pressed down. There, down on the cellar floor, lay Agatha Raisin, her face blotched with tears. The two men hurried down. Bill ripped the gag from her mouth, and then, producing a clasp knife, cut the ropes that bound her. She was going to kill me, gasped Agatha. She's coming back to kill me. Bill helped her to her feet. Agatha staggered and winced at the pain in her feet and hands, for the ropes had nearly cut off her circulation. Get her upstairs and give us some tea, said Wilkes. I'll phone Kensington. They've got Miss Partle there. The Kensington police were becoming increasingly worried. This Miss Partle was formidable and businesslike. She seemed to have powerful friends, and her boss was a tycoon. Miss Partle sensed their unease and was becoming increasingly confident. All she had to do was sit tight, and sooner or later they would release her. She was not under arrest. All she had to do was answer the questions put to her by the clowns from Merchester Police, go home and decide what to do with Agatha Raisin's body. If she and Agatha had been spotted together at the market, then she might have more questions to answer. But so long as there was no body to be found, there was not much they could do. It might be an idea to put the body in the boot of her car and dump it somewhere in Carsley. A policewoman had been sitting with her. But the door of the interview room opened and two detectives came in. They looked at her grimly. One said, We'll start the questioning when Detective Chief Inspector Wilkes of the Merchester CID arrives. It was then that Miss Partle realised she could not remember locking her front door. John Armitage arrived just as Bill and Wilkes were ushering Agatha into their police car. Come with us, said Bill, and look after your fiancé. She was nearly killed. As they drove to the police station, Agatha told her story. I wonder why she attacked you, said John, when Agatha had finished. I mean, you didn't say anything that might lead her to think you had any proof at all, did you? Agatha shook her head. Mind you, I did tell her about the mobile phone, and I did say I would never give up trying to find out who did it. She was beginning to recover. The old Agatha Raisin was coming back. And the old Agatha Raisin was thinking what a pill John was. No glad hugs or kisses. No cries of, darling, are you all right? Sod him. At the police station, John was told to wait while Agatha was led off by a detective to give her statement. Bill and Wilkes entered the interview room where Miss Partle was sitting. Wilkes said, I'm charging you with the attempted murder of Mrs. Agatha Raisin. And Miss Partle began to scream. Chapter 11 The Last Chapter Bill began to think she'd gone mad and that they were never going to get a coherent statement out of her. But at last she calmed and it all came out. I am devoted to my boss, she said in a flat, even voice. I did everything for him, more than his wife. I made him the best coffee. I put his shirt in the laundry. I bought the Christmas and birthday presents for his children as well as dealing with his business affairs. Then I received a message one day to say there was a Mr. Tristan Delon in reception. He wished to see Mr. Bincer with a view to getting a charitable donation towards a boys' club. I sent down a message that he should put his request in writing. Wilkes occasionally interrupted to ask for times and dates. He must have somehow got a description of me from one of the receptionists, but when I left that evening he was waiting for me. He invited me for dinner. He was very charming, and I knew that Mr. Bincer would never love me the way I wanted him to, and it was like a perpetual ache at my heart. Tristan made me feel attractive. 
I found myself promising him an interview with my boss. And then suddenly Mr. Bincer and Tristan seemed to be going everywhere, but Tristan was still careful to take me out as well from time to time. Then Mr. Bincer came to me and told me how he'd been cheated out of ten thousand pounds. I told Tristan to visit me at my home. I took a cricket bat to him and said that was only a taste of what he would get if he didn't return the money, and I thought that was the end of it. I checked with his vicar and found he'd moved to the country. And then when I'd all but forgotten about him, he phoned me. He said he and Mr. Binster had gone to a gay bar, and a friend who worked there had sent pictures of Tristan and Mr. Binster. Tristan said to tell Mr. Binster that if he did not pay up 250000 the photographs would go to his wife. Much as I thought Mr. Binster's wife was not worthy of him, I knew he would be devastated. I hated Tristan Delon. He'd fooled me. He'd let me think he cared for me. I went down to Carsley in disguise, dressed as a rambler. I saw a group of ramblers and tanned on to them until I got a plan of the village in my head. I was still thinking what to do. You see, I told him I had money saved and I would pay him the money myself. I watched and waited. I saw that raisin woman leave his house around midnight. And then I wondered if I could frighten him into leaving. So I phoned him and told him I would call on him the following day and I would shoot him. You see, I was beginning to wonder if there really were any photographs because I'd asked my boss if he'd ever been to a gay bar, and he said he hadn't. And Mr. Binser, she said, all mad pride, never lies. Tristan did sound frightened. But I waited. I saw him slip out and walk to the vicarage. He entered by the French windows. I slipped in after him. I saw him open a box and take money out, and at the same time I saw the paper knife gleaming in the moonlight. I seized it and stabbed him and left. I parked my car among woods at the top of the hill, and I made my way across the fields to it. She fell silent. Miss Jellop? prompted Wilkes. Why her? Tristan had told her. She said he'd left the photos with a Mrs. Slither, but that she, Miss Jellop, knew all about it. She said he'd got drunk one day and told her. She said she was going to the police. She said she was up in London and calling from a phone box. I couldn't have that. I said I would call on her and give her a full explanation. I was so lucky to get to her first. But would it never end? Then I had that sliver woman saying she was sure Tristan had told her that he had enough evidence to ruin Mr. Binser. I hoped it was over, but then I began to worry about Peggy Sliver. Getting rid of her would make sure there would be an end to it. I carefully looked through her house after I'd killed her without disturbing anything, but could not see any photographs. I waited and prayed but it became evident that the police had not found any either. You won't tell Mr. Binster about any of this. I would not want to lose his respect. I'm afraid we'll have to, said Wilkes, and Miss Portle began to cry. Agatha, for the next few weeks, was frightened into domesticity. Doris Simpson, her cleaner, had gone on holiday to Spain, leaving Agatha to look after her cat, Scrabble. Agatha had brought back Scrabble from one of her cases, had rescued Scrabble, but the ungrateful cat seemed to be pining for the missing Doris and did not appear to remember Agatha at all. Agatha polished and cleaned and had a brave try of making apple jelly from a basket of windfall apples which Farmer Brent had given her, but it would not set, so she gave the jars of runny liquid to Mrs. Bloxby, who miraculously did something to them to turn them into golden jelly. The vicar, Alf Bloxby, had called in person to thank Agatha for her help. He made such a polite and formal speech that Agatha wryly thought that his wife had coached him in what to say. John Armitage was often up in London, and she saw little of him. Then Bill Wong called round to tell Agatha that Miss Partle had gone completely mad, and it was doubtful if she would ever stand trial. It was a visit from Binster that seems to have sent her over the edge, said Bill. He'd got her the best lawyer, but she kept asking to see him. I don't know what was said, but after his visit they had to put her in a straitjacket. One always thinks of romantic people as suffering from undying passion, not plain middle-aged secretaries. Those gay photographs that Wilkes told me about, had Benson known anything about them? No, oh, evidently all he remembers is her asking him if he'd ever gone to a gay bar, and he was surprised. Said no one asked her why. She'd responded with something non-committal. As for Jellop and Slither, their end was partly your fault, Agatha. How come? I think both of them were jealous of you and wanted to show they could be detectives as well. 
It's very dangerous to keep things from the police. You should have told me about your suspicions, not gone to see her yourself. I mean, what on earth were you thinking of going back with her to her house? It was when I met her in the Portobello Market, said Agatha. She seemed so normal that I decided I must have been fantasizing. But it was a leap in the dark to suspect her. It was this secretary business, said Agatha. I was a secretary once. People think because of women's lib that secretaries no longer make the coffee or things like that. But the top flight go on more like wives. Some of them even choose schools for the boss's children. There's an intimacy springs up. Often boss and secretary work together late. Men like to talk about their work, and secretaries make good listeners, while wives at home get bored with it all. He probably saw Miss Portal as a cross between mother and helper, and she probably lived on romantic dreams of him. Tristan must have provided a brief holiday from her obsession until she found out that he'd been using her, and all her passion for Bincer would return and engulf her. Bill's eyes were shrewd. You sound as if you're speaking from personal experience. No, just speculation. How's Alice? She's fine. I thought after that scene at the duck races that it would all be over. She was drunk. She cried so hard and apologized so sincerely that I was quite touched. You're touched in the head, said Agatha acidly. What's that supposed to mean? Bill, trust me, Alice is one cast-iron bitch. She wants to get married, and with that mouth of hers I doubt if anyone else would have her. Bill stood up and jerked on his coat. Just because you've been crossed in love, Agatha, you see the worst in anyone else's romance. You should be ashamed of yourself. Who I see or what I do is none of your business. But Bill, wailed Agatha, I'm off. After he had gone, Agatha sat feeling miserable. If she wanted to retain his friendship, she would need to apologize to him. But what on earth did he see in the awful Alice? Restless, she looked around her gleaming cottage. Better to get started on the old folks' club and take her mind off things. She walked along to the vicarage. Mrs. Bloxby was out in the garden planting winter pansies. You look upset, Mrs. Raisin, she said, straightening up from a flower bed. It's not too cold today. I'll bring some coffee out into the garden so you can have a cigarette and you can tell me what's been going on. When they were seated at the garden table with mugs of coffee, Mrs. Bloxby asked, What's up? It's Bill, said Agatha. You'll never believe this. He's still devoted to Alice. And what's that got to do with you? He's my friend and he's making a terrible mistake. I told him she was a cast-iron bitch. Oh, Mrs. Raisin, you cannot interfere in a relationship. Really? It was you who told me my marriage to James would be a disaster. The vicar's wife looked rueful. So I did, but I was so worried about you, as I am about Bill. True, but you'd better apologize. He's too good a friend to lose. Agatha sighed. I'm tired of blundering around other people's lives. I thought I would sound out some builders about getting the church hall roof repaired for a start. I'm so glad you're still going to go on with that. John Fletcher at the pub is going to take the wine and label it as a liqueur. He says half of the price of each glass sold will go to the new club. That's handsome of him. I'll make a push and try to get it all ready by Christmas. Have some sort of party. When is the trial? asked Mrs. Bloxby. It seems as if there isn't going to be one. Miss Partle has lost her marbles and will be considered unfit to stand trial. You know I had one thought when I was lying in that cellar. I haven't made a will. Maybe I'll leave it all to the church and go straight to heaven. You'll want to leave it to your husband. What husband? I cannot imagine you staying single for the rest of your life. Agatha grinned. Maybe I'll marry John Armitage after all. There's not enough of a spark there. Does one need a spark at my age? At any age. I'll think about it. I'll go home and phone around some builders. Agatha went to feed her cats, because their bowls were empty and she couldn't remember feeding them. I'm turning into a compulsive cat feeder, she thought, as she poached fish for them and then set it aside to cool. She saw John's keys lying on the kitchen counter and decided to go next door and pick up his mail from the doormat and put it on his desk. 
In his cottage, she scooped up the pile of post. She looked thoughtfully at his answering machine. Why all these trips to London? Feeling guilty, she laid down the post on his desk and crossed to the answering machine. There were several messages, and all from Charlotte Bellinge. He must have saved them, thought Agatha dismally. The first one was Charlotte apologising for bringing some man called Giles to dinner. Do forgive me, dear John, she cooed. Do let me take you out for dinner and make it up to you. The second said, What a wonderful time we had. Pippa is giving a party tomorrow night. Do say you'll come. And the third, I'm running a bit late. Can you pick me up at nine instead of eight? Dying to see you. So that's that, thought Agatha. No heading into the sunset of middle age with John Armitage. She went home and arranged the cooled fish in bowls for the cats. The loneliness of the cottage seemed to press down on her. Agatha picked up the phone and dialed old Mr. Crinstead's number. Feel like coming out for dinner? she asked. Delighted, said the old man. I'll pick you up in half an hour, said Agatha. Agatha found she was enjoying herself in Mr. Crinstead's company. They discussed plans for the old folks' club, and Mr. Crinstead promised to teach Agatha chess. I'm so glad you called, Mrs. Raisin, he said. I wanted to hear all about the murders. I would have called earlier, lied Agatha, who had practically until that evening forgotten Mr. Crinstead's existence, but I've been settling down after the shock of it all. Tell me about it, Mrs. Raisin. Agatha. Right. My name is Ralph. So Agatha did, while Ralph Quinstead listened intently. When she had finished, he said, It's odd, all the same. What's odd? This Miss Partle must have been so used to discussing everything with him, I'm surprised she decided to take matters into her own hands. I've met Bin, so he's a straightforward man. He probably never noticed much about her, thought of her as a bit of office machinery. I think any man who had a secretary so much in love with him would have noticed something. Maybe he did and took it as his due. Men do, you know. Some men. I'm just glad it's all over and Alf Bloxby's in the clear. Not that there was ever any evidence against him, but there was gossip, and gossip in a small village can be very dangerous. True. Have you ever played chess before? No, never. Like to learn? I wouldn't mind. Then I'll give you lessons. After she dropped Mr. Quinstead off at his home, Agatha reflected that it was a long time since she'd enjoyed such a carefree evening. She promised to call on Ralph Quinstead in a couple of days' time and start her chess lessons. Then tomorrow she would see what estimate the builders came up with for the roof. The ring on her finger sparkled. Masquerade over, said Agatha ruefully to her cats. She took off the ring and put it in the kitchen drawer. She wondered how John was getting on with Charlotte, and realised with relief that his relationship didn't bother her in the slightest. Or that was what she believed. Almost impossible to imagine John getting passionate about anyone. Like Miss Partle. Poor Miss Partle. Now why think that? This was a woman who was a stone-cold murderer, and who was probably faking insanity. John Armitage was at another hot and noisy party in Chelsea, with Charlotte flirting with a group of men across the room. But he could bear it. Tonight was going to be the night. Hadn't she said they would just drop in for an hour and then go home together? He remembered fondly the seductive look in her eyes when she'd said those words, and the caress in her voice. He'd been disappointed that she'd still shown no interest in the murders, except to laugh and say that Agatha Raisin was a formidable woman. John looked at his watch, only half listening to the woman next to him, who was telling him that she was sure she could sit down and write a book if she only had the time. They had been there two hours, and Charlotte showed no signs of leaving. Time to take charge. He crossed the room and took her arm in a possessive grip. Time we were leaving. Oh, darling, Charlotte pouted prettily. We're all going on to Jilly's party. John did not know who this Jilly was, and he did not care. He said stiffly, Either we leave now, or I'm going home. Then you'd better go. But why not come with us? It'll be fun. Good night, snapped John. As he strode to the door, he heard one of the men with Charlotte laugh and say, 
There goes another of Charlotte's walkers. His face flamed. That had been all she'd really wanted from him, an escort to walk her to the endless social function she loved. His thoughts turned to Agatha on the road home. He'd been neglecting her along with his work. He would get going on the book for a couple of days and then take her out for dinner. The damn Charlotte Bellinge, she'd really led him a fine dance. Agatha was busy with the builders next day and with looking around the church hall. Old people liked comfort and dignity. The floor would need a carpet, and she would need to supply comfortable chairs and tables. Bookshelves along one wall for books, games and jigsaws. What else? The walls painted, of course, but not in those dreadful pink and pale blue pastel colours do gooders like to inflict on the old, as if catering for a second childhood. Plain white would do, with pictures. It should really be called the Agatha Raisin Club, considering all the work and money she was putting into it. But Mrs. Bloxby would think she was being grandiose. Of course, she had promised to think up some fundraising venture, so that she would not have to bear all the cost herself. Agatha's mind worked busily. An auction would be a good idea. She'd raised a lot of money for one of those before, by going around the country houses and getting them to contribute. Or what about getting some well-known pop group to put on a concert? No, scrub that. It will bring in too much mess and probably drugs as well. She must think of something. She walked back to her cottage in the pouring rain, trying to avoid the puddles gathering amongst the fallen leaves. In her cottage there was a note lying on the kitchen table from Doris Simpson, one of the few women in Carsley to use Agatha's first name. Dear Agatha, she read, I've taken poor Scrubble home to feed. That looks half-starved. Be round to clean as usual next week. Doris. Bloody cat ate like a horse, muttered Agatha. The doorbell rang. Agatha answered it. John stood there. He'd suddenly decided he wanted to see Agatha. Yes? asked Agatha coldly. Can I come in? It's bucketing with rain. He followed her into the kitchen. So what were you doing in London? asked Agatha. This and that. Bookshops, agent, publisher, the usual round. Are you free for dinner this evening? I think I've got a date, lied Agatha. I'll check. She dialed Mr. Quinstead's number. Is our date for tonight, Ralph, sweetie? asked Agatha in a husky voice. I thought we'd arrange to play chess tomorrow, came the surprised voice at the other end. But tonight, any time is fine. Look forward to it, said Agatha. See you then. She put down the receiver and turned to John. Sorry, I've got a date. Well, what about tomorrow? Sorry, going to be busy for some time. And I am not interested in Charlotte Bellinger's leavings, thought Agatha. She must have ditched him. I'll leave you to it. John marched out, feeling doubly rejected. The rain poured down. What are they doing stuck in this village, thought John angrily. It doesn't help a bit with the writing. I was better off in London. After he had gone, Agatha took the ring he had given her out of the drawer and put it in an envelope. On her way out that evening, she popped it through his letterbox. Not that she was jealous of Charlotte Bellinge. For Ralph Quinstead's sake, Agatha tried to concentrate on her chess lesson, while privately wondering what could be the fun in playing such a boring game. There seemed to be so much to memorise. I don't think you're going to make a chess player, said Ralph finally. You're not enjoying this one bit. I will, I will, said Agatha. And with a rare burst of honesty, she added, You see, I'm not used to concentrating on anything other than people. What motivates them, why they commit murder, that sort of thing. Let's try again another night. I'll buy some sort of book. Chess made easy or something like that, so I'll be geared up next time. If you say so. Do you play cards? Don't know many games. Poker? I once played poker. You like a game? Sure. Agatha actually won the first game and began to enjoy herself. It had reached midnight when she finally put down the cards and said ruefully, I'm keeping you up late. Doesn't matter. I don't sleep much. The old don't, you know. As Agatha drove home, she thought with a shiver of impending old age and loneliness. Would she endure white nights and long days? Would her joints seize up with arthritis? Tomorrow, she thought gloomily, 
I'll draft out my will. I'm not immortal. Had the weather cleared up, Agatha might have put off thoughts of making out a will, but another day of rain blurred the windows of her cottage and thudded down on the already rain-soaked garden. She went into the sitting room, carrying her cigarettes and a mug of coffee, and sat down at her desk. She took a small tape recorder out of her drawer, and had got as far as, This is the last will and testament of Mrs. Agatha Raisin, when there was a ring at the doorbell. Last, muttered Agatha, and went to answer it. Mr. Bincer stood there. Good heavens, said Agatha, come in out of this dreadful rain. What brings you? I just came to see you and thank you for clearing up those dreadful murders, said the tycoon. I'm curious. How did you arrive at the truth? Agatha took his coat and ushered him into the sitting room. Coffee? No, he said, sitting down on the sofa. I haven't much time. So how did you guess it was my Miss Partle? Agatha, glad of an opportunity to brag, told him how she'd managed to leap to the conclusion that the culprit was Miss Partle. Interesting, he said when she'd finished. You seem such a confident lady. Are you never wrong? I pride myself I'm not. He was certainly right about Miss Partle's adoration of me. Agatha felt a lurch in her stomach. You mean I was wrong about something else? If there's one thing I hate, it is busy body interfering women. The rain drummed against the windows and dripped from the thatch outside. The day was growing darker. Agatha switched on a lamp next to her. That's better, she said, with a lightness she did not feel. At least you don't go around killing them. There was a long silence while Bincer studied her. Agatha broke it by saying sharply, I have a feeling you came to tell me something. Yes, you are so unbearably smug. You see, Miss Partle didn't commit these murders. I did. Agatha goggled at him. Why? How? In all my life, he said calmly, no one has ever managed to put one over on me except Tristan Delon. I suppose in my way I was as infatuated with that young man as Miss Partle was with me. I married for money, the daughter of a wealthy company director. I never had any real friends. I felt I could be honest with Tristan. I could relax with him. Then he treated me. All he'd ever wanted from me was money. I hated him. I have certain underworld contacts which come in useful from time to time. I arranged to have him beaten up. I got Miss Partle to tell him who had done it. He returned the money, and I thought that was that. But the leech wouldn't let go. He phoned Miss Partle and said he was going to tell my wife unless I paid up. I found he'd gone to the country. I went down to Carsley. I'd already studied Ordnance Survey maps of the area. I dressed as a rambler and left my car hidden some distance outside the village and crossed the field so that I would get down to where he was living without being seen. I decided to give him one more chance. I had his mobile phone number. I phoned Miss Partle and told her to go out to the nearest phone box and call him and tell him I was coming to kill him. I thought I would give him a chance to run for it. I hid behind one of the gravestones in the churchyard where I could watch the entrance to his cottage. The door is clearly illuminated by that one streetlight. I saw him slip out and head for the vicarage. I saw him enter by those French windows and followed him. There he stood in the moonlight like a fallen angel, rifling the contents of the church box. I saw that paper knife. I was in such a blinding rage I did not know it was so sharp. I drove it down into his neck. And then I ran. I told Miss Partle what I had done, and she said that no one would ever suspect me. And then you came to see me. I thought I'd shut you up with my statement to the police. And then I found myself being threatened by a village spinster called Jellop, who Tristan had told about me. She said she felt she should go to the police with what she knew. She said Tristan had photographs of the pair of us in a gay bar. Now Tristan had taken me to one once. I said I would call and see her, and she was not to go to the police until I explained things. So that was the end of her. When Peggy Slither told me she actually had the photographs, I thought the nightmare would never end. I said I would pay her 200000 for the photos, and she agreed. I didn't trust her. She kept crowing about what a great detective she was. I felt she might take my money and tell the police all the same. After she'd handed me the photographs and I'd given her the money, she suddenly snatched back the photographs. This isn't right, she said. I told someone I would go to the police and so I will. I found out that she'd not mentioned my name. 
I said mildly, all right, but what about a cup of tea? What a triumphant bully she was. I followed her quietly into her kitchen and slid a carving knife out of the drawer. She turned just as I was raising the knife and screamed. He shrugged, but it was too late. Agatha felt cold sweat trickling down the back of her neck. I made an arrangement with Miss Partle that, should anything break, she was to take the blame. But why should she do that? demanded Agatha hoarsely, while her frightened eyes roamed around the room looking for a weapon. I told her if she took the rap, with good behaviour she'd be out in ten years' time and I would marry her. I knew she would go through hell if only I married her. Are you going to kill me? asked Agatha. No, you silly cow, I'm not. You have no proof. And poor Miss Partle is now stone mad. You won't get anything out of her. If it hadn't been for you, she wouldn't be in prison. I couldn't bear the idea of you sitting smugly in your cottage thinking what a great detective you are. I'll tell the police, panted Agatha. And what proof will they find? Nothing. You'll find that the police, having got her confession, will not thank you for trying to reopen the case. I have powerful friends. Goodbye, Mrs. Raisin. Agatha sat very still. She heard the door slam. She heard him driving off. She tried to stand up, but her legs were trembling so much she collapsed back into her chair. And then she saw her tape recorder sitting on the desk. She had forgotten to turn it off. Now a burst of rage and energy flooded her body. She went to the desk and re-ran the tape and switched it on. It was all there. Agatha picked up the phone and dialed Murchis to police headquarters and explained she had the real murderer. She got put straight through to Wilkes, who listened in astonished silence and then began to rap out questions. When had he left? What car was he driving? When Agatha replaced the phone, she wondered whether to call John and then decided against it. Although she would never admit it to herself, she viewed his pursuit of Charlotte Bellinger as a rejection of herself. She phoned the vicarage instead, only to learn that Mrs. Bloxby was out. The doorbell went. It couldn't be the police already. Agatha went into the kitchen and slid a knife out of the drawer and approached the door. She peered through the peephole in the door and saw with a flood of relief the elderly face of Ralph Crimstead under a dripping hat. You'll never guess what happened, she cried, brandishing the kitchen knife in her excitement. Be careful with that knife, Agatha, he said nervously. Oh, what? Gosh, I was frightened. The police are on their way. May I come in? It's awfully wet. Yes, come along. I hope I'm not disturbing you. I thought up a few ideas for the old folks' club. You seem to be in the middle of a drama. Agatha led him into the sitting room. I don't know about you, but I would like a large brandy. Care to join me? Why not? Once the drinks were poured, Agatha got halfway through her story when Bill Wong arrived with another detective. He asked to hear the tape. Agatha switched it on, wincing at the earlier bit, which included the start of her will and then all her bragging. But then Bince's dry, precise voice describing the murders sounded in the room. We'll get him, said Bill. We have his registration number. He'll be stopped before he reaches London. I think we'd better start ferreting in his background. He was up for a knighthood, you know. You better come back with us to Merchester, Agatha, and make a full statement. Agatha was taken over her statement again and again until she was gratefully able to sign it. She then had a long talk with Bill which depressed her. He was doubtful whether the tape alone would be enough to convict Bincer. Poor Miss Partle. Had Bincer said something to her during his prison visit that had finally tipped her over the edge? Had he always been respectable? John Armitage watched her climbing out of a police car that evening. He hurried round to her cottage and listened amazed to the story that Agatha was now heartily tired of telling. "'Did they get Bincer? John asked when she had finished. "'He was stopped on the road to London. He's denying everything. He's got a team of lawyers. Bill says they're digging into his past. He says Bincer seems always to have been a pretty ruthless person. And you thought he was straightforward and decent. I got there in the end.' said Agatha crossly. Get your ring all right. Thank you. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking of moving back to London. Not a good time to sell. The house market's in a slump at the moment. I'll take what I can get. And, John added with a tinge of malice, I shall think of you down here busy at work on your old folks' club. So Miss Partle's off the hook. 
if she ever recovers her sanity, she'll probably be charged with aiding and abetting a murderer and attempting to murder me. I'm glad it's all over. It's up to the police now to prove he did it. They've got that taped confession. Bill told me after I'd made my statement that he might get away with it. He's saying he only told me a load of rubbish because he thought I was so smug. He's insisting it was a joke at my expense. Also, I don't know if that tape would stand up in court. There was no one in authority here. He wasn't cautioned, and he wasn't on oath. You should be worried. If he gets away with it, he'll come looking for you. No, he won't, said Agatha. I'm no threat to him. He seemed pretty confident I couldn't find out anything. And if they don't get him this time, then they can't charge him with the same crime twice. Well, I can't share your confidence. I'd best be off. I've got enough in the bank to rent somewhere in London until this place is sold. Agatha wanted to say, Will you miss me? Did you care anything for me at all? But fear of rejection kept her silent. Instead, she said, I suppose you'll be seeing a lot of Charlotte Bellinge. That silly woman, he said viciously. No, she turned out to be a terrible bore. I shall be glad to return to all the fun and lights of London. The thought of being buried down here in the winter is an awful prospect. I don't know how you cope with it. Some people would think three murders was enough excitement for anyone. Anyway, see you around, maybe. John went back to his cottage and stood looking around. May as well think of packing some things up. He'd be glad to get away. And whoever it was that Agatha was romancing, he wished her the joy of him. He didn't care. She meant nothing to him. Infuriating woman. And as a proof of his lack of interest in Agatha Raisin, he kicked the wastebasket clear across the room. Epilogue Despite Agatha's assurances to John that she was not worried that Vincent would come looking for her, she felt edgy and nervous. She tried to call Bill several times, only to be told that he was not available, and her heart sank. She really should have apologised to him about her remarks about Alice. So when she opened the door to him a week after Bincer had been arrested, she flew at him crying, Oh, Bill, I'm so sorry about those dreadful things I said about Alice. That's all right, he said. Let's go in. I have some good news for you. Never mind about coffee, he said, walking with her into the kitchen to a glad welcome from the cats. I want to tell you right away. What? We've got Bincer all sewn up. How? What happened? Well, I phoned the top psychiatrist at that psychiatric prison she's in and asked how Miss Parker was getting on. He said he was just drafting a report. He said he was rapidly coming to the conclusion that she was faking madness. Maybe she was tired of keeping up the act, but he said twice he had surprised her reading a book with all the appearance of intelligent enjoyment. I talked to my superiors and arranged an interview. She sat drooling in front of me, all blank-eyed. I told her the Bincer had confessed. I didn't tell her he might get away with it. She looked at me startled, and then she began to cry. She switched the mad act right off. She said when he had visited her in prison, she'd asked him whether he told his wife yet that they were going to get married. He said, not yet. He would wait until she was free, and then they would run off together. It was that, she said, that suddenly made her realize he was lying, for she knew he would never leave his work. He relished his position, and he relished power. But she did not know what to do. She still loved him, however, still hoped. She said she'd sunk so low that all she wanted to do was live in the hope of seeing him again. He told her if she faked madness, then she wouldn't stand trial. I was wondering how to get some actual proof of his culpability out of her, so I said there was no death penalty, and she could wait for him, for the charge of conspiracy to murder plus attempted murder would carry less of a sentence. She said she would not have killed you. She'd phoned him, and he'd said to frighten you as much as possible while he worked out what to do. She said she wouldn't actually have hit you with that hammer. So how did you get the goods on Bincer out of her? asked Agatha. I told her that Bincer had told you that he'd never loved her and she was easy to use, that he had no intention of ever leaving his wife. She started to cry again, and after a bit she became very angry. Miss Partle said that he'd written a confession to the murders, so that after his death she would be exonerated. Why she fell for that one I do not know, as he could have outlived her. I asked where the confession was. She said they had various subsidiary companies, and in the safe of an office in Docklands we would find a confession. 
and started at things she could not stop. She told me about insider trading deals, intimidation of companies who wished to take over the lot. I couldn't believe my luck. I phoned Wilkes, who said he would be down hot fort with two detectives and a tape recorder. I was terrified while I waited that she would regret the whole thing and slip back into a pretended madness. We raided the safe of a company called Heighton Electronics, and there was a confession, along with a set of account books he certainly would not want the income tax people to see. So he's been charged. What a relief, said Agatha. I told John I was sure he wouldn't come looking for me, but I'd begun to jump at every sound. Where is John? There's a for sale sign outside his cottage. He's going to rent a flat in London. He's already sent off most of his stuff. That's quick work. Though it's easy to rent a flat in London if you've got the money. So, no engagement? No, there wasn't enough there. I gave him back his ring. Did that upset you? Bill looked at her shrewdly. Not very much. He was a bore, said Agatha, unconsciously echoing John's remark about Charlotte Bellinge. And I hope everything is all right with you and Alice. Well, no, it isn't. I'm sorry, Bill. It was that dreadful wine. I should never have let her have any. I got over that. People say things when they're drunk they don't really mean. She was rude to Mother. Agatha felt a pang of sympathy for Alice. What did she say? Well, Mother always does jump the gun a bit. She was saying how Alice and me could save money after we were married by moving in with them. Mum and Dad, that is. Alice said to her, Don't be ridiculous, I've already picked out a nice bungalow for us. I pointed out it was the first I'd heard of it. Alice said, I couldn't live here, they'd drive me mad. I got very angry, but I still thought it was maybe the wrong time of the month or something. Alice insisted we drive out of Merchester on the other side of the Ring Road where she said this bungalow was. It was quite large, an estate agent was showing a couple round. I asked how much it was selling for, and he said 180000 I pointed out to Alice I could never afford that. My pay isn't great, you know. She asked why I hadn't saved anything living at home. I said I paid Mum and Dad for my keep. She went absolutely ballistic and called me all kinds of fool, so I told her I never wanted to see her again. Don't you want to live on your own? asked Agatha curiously. There's police accommodation in Merchester, isn't there? Get your independence. I have my independence, said Bill, puzzled. All my meals are prepared for me, and I have my own room at home. Agatha decided to drop the subject. I feel a fool the way I went on, she said. I was completely taken in by Bim, sir. He's the fool, said Bill. He was very lucky no one ever saw him. Mrs. Bloxby saw you leaving Tristan's at midnight. Pretty she didn't look out of the window later on in the night. Miss Jellop's neighbours happened to be away or busy. Peggy Slither often played loud music and her neighbours aren't all that close to her. Maybe it takes an amateur to find an amateur. Except I got the wrong amateur. Did Vincent say what he planned to do with me? I mean, I had told John I was going to see Miss Partle. He's already accused of enough, so he sticks to the story that he told Miss Partle to frighten you so that you'd drop the whole thing. I can't see her believing that. She was so much in love with him and already in such a state of panic that she didn't think clearly. I never saw a less frightened woman. Maybe he planned to dump your body somewhere and then arrange things so that it would look as if you'd left the country. I don't know. I think you should take things easy from now on, Agatha. I plan to. In the weeks leading up to Christmas, Agatha threw herself into preparations for the old folks club. She raised money by deciding after all to hold an auction, and then held several bingo evenings in the school hall, much to the distress of the vicar who felt it was encouraging gambling. The opening party on Christmas Eve was a great success. The Ladies' Society organised a roster of drivers to take the infirm elderly to the club. In the new year, Ralph Quinstead started his chess classes. Agatha felt mildly guilty that she'd done nothing about taking further lessons from him, although he seemed to have a good few willing pupils. It was the end of January before she realised that the for sale sign outside John's cottage had gone. Agatha hurried along to the vicarage. Who's my new neighbour? she asked Mrs. Bloxby. I believe it is a certain Mr. Paul Chatterton, some sort of computer expert. Oh, some computer nerd. Anyway, I'm not interested in men any more. I thought John might have called at least once. I wouldn't worry about him. I think he was a bit of a lightweight. 
Agatha looked at her in surprise. It was highly unusual for the vicar's wife to say anything critical about anyone. Mrs. Boxby coloured. I do not like the way he treated you. I do wish you would find someone suitable. I tell you, I've given up. There aren't any suitable men when you get to my age anyway. God will provide, said Mrs. Bloxby sententiously. Agatha grinned as the vision of a handsome bachelor, gift-wrapped and descending from heaven, entered her mind. When she walked back to her cottage, she saw there was a removal van outside. Overseeing the unloading of it was what was obviously the new tenant. He was middle-aged, but tall and fit-looking. He had a shock of white hair and a thin, clever face and sparkling black eyes. Agatha hurried indoors. She picked up the phone and made an appointment with the hairdresser and then the beautician. Not that she was interested in men any more. Still, it didn't do to let oneself go. This concludes the reading of Agatha Raisin and the Case of the Curious Curate by M. C. Beaton. Copyright 2003 by M. C. Beaton. This full-length reading was published by arrangement with Bowenstein Associates Incorporated and was produced in 2003 by Books on Tape Incorporated, which holds the copyright thereto. This book was read by Donada Peters. Now, why think that? This was a woman who was a stone-cold murderess and who was probably faking insanity. John Armitage was at another hot and noisy party in Chelsea, with Charlotte flirting with a group of men across the room. But he could bear it. Tonight was going to be the night. Hadn't she said they would just drop in for an hour and then go home together? He remembered fondly the seductive look in her eyes when she'd said those words, and the caress in her voice. He'd been disappointed that she'd still shown no interest in the murders, except to laugh and say that Agatha Raisin was a formidable woman. John looked at his watch, only half listening to the woman next to him, who was telling him that she was sure she could sit down and write a book if she only had the time. They had been there two hours, and Charlotte showed no signs of leaving. Time to take charge. He crossed the room and took her arm in a possessive grip. Time we were leaving. Oh, darling! Charlotte pouted prettily. They're all going on to Jilly's party. John did not know who this Jilly was, and he did not care. He said stiffly, Either we leave now, or I'm going home. Then you'd better go. But why not come with us? It'll be fun. Good night, snapped John. As he strode to the door, he heard one of the men with Charlotte laugh and say, There goes another of Charlotte's walkers. His face flamed. That had been all she'd really wanted from him, an escort to walk her to the endless social function she loved. His thoughts turned to Agatha on the road home. He'd been neglecting her along with his work. He would get going on the book for a couple of days and then take her out for dinner. But damn Charlotte Bellinge, she'd really led him a fine dance. Agatha was busy with the builders next day and with looking around the church hall. Old people liked comfort and dignity. The floor would need a carpet, and she would need to supply comfortable chairs and tables. Bookshelves along one wall for books, games and jigsaws. What else? The walls painted, of course, but not in those dreadful pink and pale blue pastel colours do-gooders like to inflict on the old, as if catering for a second childhood. Plain white would do, with pictures. It should really be called the Agatha Raisin Club, considering all the work and money she was putting into it. But Mrs. Bloxby would think she was being grandiose. Of course, she had promised to think up some fundraising venture, so that she would not have to bear all the cost herself. Agatha's mind worked busily. An auction would be a good idea. She'd raised a lot of money for one of those before, by going around the country houses and getting them to contribute. Or what about getting some well-known pop group to put on a concert? No, scrub that. It will bring in too much mess and probably drugs as well. She must think of something. She walked back to her cottage in the pouring rain, trying to avoid the puddles gathering amongst the fallen leaves. In her cottage there was a note lying on the kitchen table from Doris Simpson, one of the few women in Carsley to use Agatha's first name. Dear Agatha, she read, I've taken boys' scrubble home to feed. That looks half-starved. 
Be round to clean as usual next week, Doris. Bloody cat ate like a horse, muttered Agatha. The doorbell rang. Agatha answered it. John stood there. He'd suddenly decided he wanted to see Agatha. Yes? asked Agatha coldly. Can I come in? It's bucketing with rain. He followed her into the kitchen. So what were you doing in London? asked Agatha. This and that. Bookshops, agent, publisher, the usual round. Are you free for dinner this evening? I think I've got a date, lied Agatha. I'll check. She dialed Mr. Quinstead's number. Is our date for tonight, Ralph, sweetie? asked Agatha in a husky voice. I thought we'd arrange to play chess tomorrow, came the surprised voice at the other end. But tonight, any time is fine. Look forward to it, said Agatha. See you then. She put down the receiver and turned to John. Sorry, I've got a date. Well, what about tomorrow? Sorry, going to be busy for some time. And I am not interested in Charlotte Bellinger's leavings, thought Agatha. She must have ditched him. I'll leave you to it. John marched out, feeling doubly rejected. The rain poured down. What am I doing stuck in this village, thought John angrily. It doesn't help a bit with the writing. I was better off in London. After he had gone, Agatha took the ring he had given her out of the drawer and put it in an envelope. On her way out that evening, she popped it through his letterbox. Not that she was jealous of Charlotte Bellinge. For Ralph Quinstead's sake, Agatha tried to concentrate on her chess lesson, while privately wondering what could be the fun in playing such a boring game. There seemed to be so much to memorise. I don't think you're going to make a chess player, said Ralph finally. You're not enjoying this one bit. I will, I will, said Agatha. And with a rare burst of honesty, she added, You see, I'm not used to concentrating on anything other than people. What motivates them, why they commit murder, that sort of thing. Let's try again another night. I'll buy some sort of book. Chess made easy or something like that, so I'll be geared up next time. If you say so. Do you play cards? Don't know many games. Poker? I once played poker. You like a game? Sure. Agatha actually won the first game and began to enjoy herself. It had reached midnight when she finally put down the cards and said ruefully, I'm keeping you up late. Doesn't matter. I don't sleep much. The old don't, you know. As Agatha drove home, she thought with a shiver of impending old age and loneliness. Would she endure white nights and long days? Would her joints seize up with arthritis? Tomorrow, she thought gloomily, I'll draft out my will. I'm not immortal. Had the weather cleared up, Agatha might have put off thoughts of making out a will, but another day of rain blurred the windows of her cottage and thudded down on the already rain-soaked garden. She went into the sitting room, carrying her cigarettes and a mug of coffee, and sat down at her desk. She took a small tape recorder out of her drawer, and had got as far as, This is the last will and testament of Mrs. Agatha Raisin, when there was a ring at the doorbell. Blast, muttered Agatha, and went to answer it. Mr. Bincer stood there. Good heavens, said Agatha, come in out of this dreadful rain. What brings you? I just came to see you and thank you for clearing up those dreadful murders, said the tycoon. I'm curious. How did you arrive at the truth? Agatha took his coat and ushered him into the sitting room. Coffee? No, he said, sitting down on the sofa. I haven't much time. So how did you guess it was my Miss Partle? Agatha, glad of an opportunity to brag, told him how she'd managed to leap to the conclusion that the culprit was Miss Partle. Interesting he said when she'd finished. You seem such a confident lady. Are you never wrong? I pride myself I'm not. He was certainly right about Miss Partle's adoration of me. Agatha felt a lurch in her stomach. You mean I was wrong about something else? If there's one thing I hate, it is busy body interfering women. The rain drummed against the windows and dripped from the thatch outside. The day was growing darker. Agatha switched on a lamp next to her. That's better, she said, with a lightness she did not feel. At least you don't go around killing them. There was a long silence while Bincer studied her. Agatha broke it by saying sharply, I have a feeling you came to tell me something. Yes, 
You are so unbearably smug. You see, Miss Portal didn't commit these murders. I did. Agatha goggled at him. Why? How? In all my life, he said calmly, no one has ever managed to put one over on me except Tristan Delon. I suppose in my way I was as infatuated with that young man as Miss Portal was with me. I married for money, the daughter of a wealthy company director. I never had any real friends. I felt I could be honest with Tristan. I could relax with him. Then he treated me. All he'd ever wanted from me was money. I hated him. I have certain underworld contacts which come in useful from time to time. I arranged to have him beaten up. I got Miss Partle to tell him who had done it. He returned the money, and I thought that was that. But the leech wouldn't let go. He phoned Miss Partle and said he was going to tell my wife unless I paid up. I found he'd gone to the country. I went down to Carsley. I'd already studied ordnance survey maps of the area. I dressed as a rambler and left my car hidden some distance outside the village and crossed the field so that I would get down to where he was living without being seen. I decided to give him one more chance. I had his mobile phone number. I phoned Miss Partle and told her to go out to the nearest phone box and call him and tell him I was coming to kill him. I thought I would give him a chance to run for it. I hid behind one of the gravestones in the churchyard where I could watch the entrance to his cottage. The door is clearly illuminated by that one street light. I saw him slip out and head for the vicarage. I saw him enter by those French windows and followed him. There he stood in the moonlight like a fallen angel, rifling the contents of the church box. I saw that paper knife. I was in such a blinding rage I did not know it was so sharp. I drove it down into his neck. And then I ran. I told Miss Partle what I had done, and she said that no one would ever suspect me. And then you came to see me. I thought I'd shut you up with my statement to the police. Then I found myself being threatened by a village spinster called Jellop, who Trist told about me. She said she felt she should go to the police with what she knew. She said Tristan had photographs of the pair of us in a gay bar. Now Tristan had taken me to one once. I said I would call and see her, and she was not to go to the police until I explained things. So that was the end of her. When Peggy Slither told me she actually had the photographs, I thought the nightmare would never end. I said I would pay her 200000 for the photos, and she agreed. I didn't trust her. She kept crowing about what a great detective she was. I felt she might take my money and tell the police all the same. After she'd handed me the photographs and I'd given her the money, she suddenly snatched back the photographs. This isn't right, she said. I told someone I would go to the police and so I will. I found out that she'd not mentioned my name. I said mildly, all right, but what about a cup of tea? What a triumphant bully she was. I followed her quietly into her kitchen and slid a carving knife out of the drawer. She turned just as I was raising the knife and screamed. He shrugged. But it was too late. Agatha felt cold sweat trickling down the back of her neck. I made an arrangement with Miss Partle that, should anything break, she was to take the blame. But why should she do that? demanded Agatha hoarsely, while her frightened eyes roamed around the room looking for a weapon. I told her if she took the rap, with good behaviour she'd be out in ten years' time and I would marry her. I knew she would go through hell if only I married her. Are you going to kill me? asked Agatha. No, you silly cow, I'm not. You have no proof. And poor Miss Partle is now stone mad. You won't get anything out of her. If it hadn't been for you, she wouldn't be in prison. I couldn't bear the idea of you sitting smugly in your cottage thinking what a great detective you are. I'll tell the police, panted Agatha. And what proof will they find? Nothing. You will find that the police, having got her confession, will not thank you for trying to reopen the case. I have powerful friends. Goodbye, Mrs. Rosen. Agatha sat very still. She heard the door slam. She heard him driving off. She tried to stand up, but her legs were trembling so much she collapsed back into her chair. And then she saw her tape recorder sitting on the desk. She had forgotten to turn it off. Now a burst of rage and energy flooded her body. She went to the desk and re-ran the tape and switched it on. It was all there. Agatha picked up the phone and dialed Murchis to police headquarters and explained she had the real murderer. She got put straight through to Wilkes, who listened in astonished silence and then began to rap out questions. When had he left? What car was he driving? 
When Agatha replaced the phone, she wondered whether to call John, and then decided against it. Although she would never admit it to herself, she viewed his pursuit of Charlotte Bellinge as a rejection of herself. She phoned the vicarage instead, only to learn that Mrs. Bloxby was out. The doorbell went. It couldn't be the police already. Agatha went into the kitchen and slid a knife out of the drawer and approached the door. She peered through the peephole in the door and saw with a flood of relief the elderly face of Ralph Crimstead under a dripping hat. You'll never guess what happened, she cried, brandishing the kitchen knife in her excitement. Be careful with that knife, Agatha, he said nervously. Oh, what? Gosh, I was frightened. The police are on their way. May I come in? It's awfully wet. Yes, come along. I hope I'm not disturbing you. I thought up a few ideas for the old folks' club. You seem to be in the middle of a drama. Agatha led him into the sitting room. I don't know about you, but I would like a large brandy. Care to join me? Why not? Once the drinks were poured, Agatha got halfway through her story, when Bill Wong arrived with another detective. He asked to hear the tape. Agatha switched it on, wincing at the earlier bit, which included the start of her will and then all her bragging. But then Bince's dry, precise voice describing the murders sounded in the room. We'll get him, said Bill. We have his registration number. He'll be stopped before he reaches London. I think we'd better start ferreting in his background. He was up for a knighthood, you know. You'd better come back with us to Merchester, Agatha, and make a full statement. Agatha was taken over her statement again and again until she was gratefully able to sign it. She then had a long talk with Bill which depressed her. He was doubtful whether the tape alone would be enough to convict Bincer. Poor Miss Partle. Had Bincer said something to her during his prison visit that had finally tipped her over the edge? Had he always been respectable? John Armitage watched her climbing out of a police car that evening. He hurried round to her cottage and listened amazed to the story that Agatha was now heartily tired of telling. "'Did they get Bincer?' John asked when she had finished. "'He was stopped on the road to London. He's denying everything. He's got a team of lawyers. Bill says they're digging into his past. He says Bincer seems always to have been a pretty ruthless person. And you thought he was straightforward and decent. I got there in the end,' said Agatha crossly. "'Get your ring all right?' "'Thank you. As a matter of fact, I'm thinking of moving back to London.' Not a good time to sell. The house market's in a slump at the moment. I'll take what I can get. And, John added with a tinge of malice, I shall think of you down here, busy at work on your old folks' club. So Miss Partle's off the hook. If she ever recovers her sanity, she'll probably be charged with aiding and abetting a murderer and attempting to murder me. I'm glad it's all over. It's up to the police now to prove he did it. They've got that taped confession. Bill told me after I'd made my statement that he might get away with it. He's saying he only told me a load of rubbish because he thought I was so smug. He's insisting it was a joke at my expense. Also, I don't know if that tape would stand up in court. There was no one in authority here. He wasn't cautioned, and he wasn't on oath. You should be worried. If he gets away with it, he'll come looking for you. No, he won't, said Agatha. I'm no threat to him. He seemed pretty confident I couldn't find out anything. And if they don't get him this time, then they can't charge him with the same crime twice. Well, I can't share your confidence. I'd best be off. I've got enough in the bank to rent somewhere in London until this place is sold. Agatha wanted to say, Will you miss me? Did you care anything for me at all? That fear of rejection kept her silent. Instead, she said, I suppose you'll be seeing a lot of Charlotte Bellinge. That's silly woman, he said viciously. No, she turned out to be a terrible bore. I shall be glad to return to all the fun and lights of London. The thought of being buried down here in the winter is an awful prospect. I don't know how you cope with it. Some people would think three murders was enough excitement for anyone. Anyway, see you around, maybe. John went back to his cottage and stood looking around. May as well think of packing some things up. He'd be glad to get away. And whoever it was that Agatha was romancing, he wished her the joy of him. He didn't care. She meant nothing to him. Infuriating woman. And as a proof of his lack of interest in Agatha Raisin, he kicked the wastebasket clear across the room. Epilogue 
Despite Agatha's assurances to John that she was not worried that Vincent would come looking for her, she felt edgy and nervous. She tried to call Bill several times, only to be told that he was not available, and her heart sank. She really should have apologized to him about her remarks about Alice. So when she opened the door to him a week after Bincer had been arrested, she flew at him crying, Oh, Bill, I'm so sorry about those dreadful things I said about Alice. That's all right, he said. Let's go in. I have some good news for you. Never mind about coffee, he said, walking with her into the kitchen to a glad welcome from the cats. I want to tell you right away. What? We've got Bincer all sewn up. How? What happened? Well, I phoned the top psychiatrist at that psychiatric prison she's in and asked how Miss Partle was getting on. He said he was just drafting a report. He said he was rapidly coming to the conclusion that she was faking madness. Maybe she was tired of keeping up the act, but he said twice he had surprised her reading a book with all the appearance of intelligent enjoyment. I talked to my superiors and arranged an interview. She sat drooling in front of me, all blank-eyed. I told her the Bincer had confessed. I didn't tell her he might get away with it. She looked at me startled, and then she began to cry. She switched the mad act right off. She said when he had visited her in prison, she'd asked him whether he told his wife yet to get married. He said not yet. He would wait until she was free, and then they would run off together. It was that, she said, that suddenly made her realize he was lying, for she knew he would never leave his work. He relished his position, and he relished power. But she did not know what to do. She still loved him, however, still hoped. She said she'd sunk so low that all she wanted to do was live in the hope of seeing him again. He told her if she faked madness, then she wouldn't stand trial. I was wondering how to get some actual proof of his culpability out of her, so I said there was no death penalty, and she could wait for him, for the charge of conspiracy to murder plus attempted murder would carry less of a sentence. She said she would not have killed you. She'd phoned him, and he'd said to frighten you as much as possible while he worked out what to do. She said she wouldn't actually have hit you with that hammer. So how did you get the goods on Bincer out of her? asked Agatha. I told her that Bincer had told you that he'd never loved her and she was easy to use, that he had no intention of ever leaving his wife. She started to cry again, and after a bit she became very angry. Miss Partle said that he'd written a confession to the murders, so that after his death she would be exonerated. Why she fell for that one I do not know, as he could have outlived her. I asked where the confession was. She said they had various subsidiary companies, and in the safe of an office in Docklands we would find a confession. Once started, it seemed she could not stop. She told me about insider trading deals, intimidation of companies who wished to take over the lot. They couldn't believe my luck. I phoned Wilkes, who said he would be down hot fort with two detectives and a tape recorder. I was terrified while I waited that she would regret the whole thing and slip back into a pretended madness. We raided the safe of a company called Heighton Electronics, and there was a confession, along with a set of account books he certainly would not want the income tax people to see. So he's been charged. What a relief, said Agatha. I told John I was sure he wouldn't come looking for me, but I'd begun to jump at every sound. Where is John? There's a for sale sign outside his cottage. He's going to rent a flat in London. He's already sent off most of his stuff. That's quick work. Though it's easy to rent a flat in London if you've got the money. So, no engagement? No, there wasn't enough there. I gave him back his ring. Did that upset you? Bill looked at her shrewdly. Not very much. He was a bore, said Agatha, unconsciously echoing John's remark about Charlotte Bellinge. And I hope everything is all right with you and Alice. Well, no, it isn't. I'm sorry, Bill. It was that dreadful wine. I should never have let her have any. I got over that. People say things when they're drunk they don't really mean. She was rude to Mother. Agatha felt a pang of sympathy for Alice. What did she say? Well, Mother always does jump the gun a bit. She was saying how Alice and me could save money after we were married by moving in with them. Mum and Dad, that is. Ollie said to her, Don't be ridiculous, I've already picked out a nice bungalow for us. I pointed out it was the first I'd heard of it. Ollie said, I couldn't live here, they'd drive me mad. I got very angry, but I still thought it was maybe the wrong time of the month or something. Alice insisted we drive out of Merchester on the other side of the Ring Road where she said this bungalow was. It was quite large, and the estate agent was showing a couple round. 
I asked how much he was selling for, and he said 180000 I pointed out to Alice I could never afford that. My pay isn't great, you know. She asked why I hadn't saved anything living at home. I said I paid Mum and Dad for my keep. She went absolutely ballistic and called me all kinds of fool. So I told her I never wanted to see her again. Don't you want to live on your own? asked Agatha curiously. There's police accommodation in Merchester, isn't there? Get your independence. I have my independence, said Bill, puzzled. All my meals are prepared for me, and I have my own room at home. Agatha decided to drop the subject. I feel a fool the way I went on, she said. I was completely taken in by Bim, sir. He's the fool, said Bill. He was very lucky no one ever saw him. Mrs. Bloxby saw you leaving Tristan's at midnight. Pity she didn't look out of the window later on in the night. Miss Jellop's neighbours happened to be away or busy. Peggy Slither often played loud music and her neighbours aren't all that close to her. Maybe it takes an amateur to find an amateur. Except I got the wrong amateur. Did Binser say what he planned to do with me? I mean, I had told John I was going to see Miss Partle. He's already accused of enough, so he sticks to the story that he told Miss Partle to frighten you so that you'd drop the whole thing. I can't see her believing that. She was so much in love with him and already in such a state of panic that she didn't think clearly. I never saw a less frightened woman. Maybe he planned to dump your body somewhere and then arrange things so that it would look as if you'd left the country. I don't know. I think you should take things easy from now on, Agatha. I plan to. In the weeks leading up to Christmas, Agatha threw herself into preparations for the old folks' club. She raised money by deciding after all to hold an auction, and then held several bingo evenings in the school hall, much to the distress of the vicar, who felt it was encouraging gambling. The opening party on Christmas Eve was a great success. The Ladies' Society organised a roster of drivers to take the infirm elderly to the club. In the new year, Ralph Quinstead started his chess classes. Agatha felt mildly guilty that she'd done nothing about taking further lessons from him, although he seemed to have a good few willing pupils. It was the end of January before she realised that the for-sale sign outside John's cottage had gone. Agatha hurried along to the vicarage. "'Who's my new neighbour? she asked Mrs. Bloxby. "'I believe it is a certain Mr. Paul Chatterton, some sort of computer expert. "'Oh, some computer nerd. "'Anyway, I'm not interested in men any more.' I thought John might have called at least once. I wouldn't worry about him. I think he was a bit of a lightweight. Agatha looked at her in surprise. It was highly unusual for the vicar's wife to say anything critical about anyone. Mrs. Broxby coloured. I do not like the way he treated you. I do wish you would find someone suitable. I tell you, I've given up. There aren't any suitable men when you get to my age anyway. God will provide said Mrs. Bloxby sententiously. Agatha grinned as the vision of a handsome bachelor, gift-wrapped and descending from heaven, entered her mind. When she walked back to her cottage, she saw there was a removal van outside. Overseeing the unloading of it was what was obviously the new tenant. He was middle-aged, but tall and fit-looking. He had a shock of white hair and a thin, clever face and sparkling black eyes. Agatha hurried indoors. She picked up the phone and made an appointment with the hairdresser and then the beautician. Not that she was interested in men any more. Still, it didn't do to let oneself go. This concludes the reading of Agatha Raisin and the Case of the Curious Curate by M. C. Beaton. Copyright 2003 by M. C. Beaton. This full-length reading was published by arrangement with Bowenstein Associates Incorporated and was produced in 2003 by Books on Tape Incorporated, which holds the copyright there too. This book was read by Donada Peters. Nada 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 Peters. Nader Peters, 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 
Nader Peters. 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 Nader Peters.